All right. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, session. We will be talking about arms, archery, armor, and archery of the Malay world. This will be a live discussion with Tengku Nara Paduka, founder and grandmaster of Seni Padang Sukma Kencana Nara Martial Arts Academy. My name is Anwar Matsaat of Eureka Archery and Patama, and let's welcome uh, Tengku Nara Paduka this evening. How are you? Salam hormat. Salam hormat. Hello, everybody. All right, great. So um, uh, we are, first and foremost, we apologize for the slight delay of for the online discussion tonight. Uh, but we managed to rectify it and thank you everyone for being very patient with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, Pak Kunara, uh, basically tonight we will be doing a discussion. So this discussion is more to uh, is more laid back. Uh, we're not going to go too much into the nitty gritty details of citing where we get the resources and everything because most things that we'll be sharing with you today is available online. So we encourage you to do your own research and we also encourage you to challenge our ideas and propositions. This way we can all learn much better. Okay. So, okay. Yep. Uh, are you, are we ready to start, uh, Pak Kunara? Yeah. Uh, okay, the topic of discussion for today, there will be four things that we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about arms, armor, and artillery of the Malay world. It is just a snapshot because if we go too much in detail, we won't end until tomorrow. Next, we'll be talking about fighting style and equipments. Ultimately, the Janawi Sukma. And finally, a topic that is quite popular recently, physical versus spiritual armor. So we'll start with the first topic, arms, armor, and artillery of the Malay world. A snapshot. To give us an idea, this is a map uh, in the illustrations of Magat Panji Alam. When we define the Malay world, we're talking about the nations and the cultures that speak one language, which is Bahasa Melayu. So just to get things clear, uh, our playing field uh, for today, Pak Kunara, is the Malay world as seen through language and culture. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. All right, great. So for, for those of you who may not be able to read Jawi, if you're a Malay and you can't read Jawi, Jawi shame on you. You can learn from Pak Kunara on how to reach, read Jawi. Uh, but for that, we also have the contemporary accounts in English for those of you who can't read Jawi. This is basically a map of the countries wherein the Malayo language is spoken. So it covers various nations, it covers uh, various people across a vast amount of land and sea. So with that in mind, we would like to see the influence of the Malay world as seen in the map here and the 15th century Malacca and its contemporaries. This way we understand on how the Malay world evolves and accept cultures from other regions within the vicinity and along the trade routes. And do you have any opinion on this, Pak Kunara? Um, okay, uh, when we talk about Malay work, it's actually, it covers quite a, a large uh, area of influence, which uh, if you look at the map there, it extends all the way from Africa to the city. Okay, and um, some even extend all the way to Japan, to uh, Okinawa, and perhaps even the Russian uh, peninsula. So, uh, when you see Malay, and you are covering a very wide area. So, for tonight, uh, like you said, we will be focusing on the Malay speaking area, which would be somewhere uh, from the borders of Burma until the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so since we have a basic understanding of the geographical location that we'll be talking about today, so this is done to basically to show the Malay culture as a culture, as a people, not any individual countries. So we hope we get that very clear among all of you. So if we show you something that comes from Indonesia or from Southern Philippines, uh, we're not claiming that it's Malaysian, we are claiming that it is of the Malay culture or the Malay world in general. So let's hope to get that disclaimer out and clear. Yeah, we, we should um, really understand that when you say Malay, it's a new country. 
we talk about Malay, we're talking about the people. So it is a it is a wider it covers a wider area. That's right. So I hope we can um, we can accept and understand that for this uh, purpose of the discussion tonight. That's right. That's right. And we'll, uh, I would like to also um, get your opinion on the idea of the trade routes first, as we have discussed earlier, but ultimately how it shapes the geography and the landscape of the Malay world, which is through the spread of the Islamic crescent. How does the religion actually bring forth culture, learning, education? Perhaps you can give some input on this, on the Islamic crescent's impact on the Malay world. Okay, um, if we look at the map, um, we can see that Malacca is the center of the Malay world. We see that people from around the world come to Malacca to pray. And uh, this is not uh, necessarily mean to pray uh, in terms of good, but uh, some of them come and... Uh, they they, uh, they bring along their culture, even their religious. So when we talk about uh, Islamic questions, uh, as you say, um, it is a very good point of uh, how to disseminate or how to uh, protect the teachings of Islam throughout the entire um, Malay world. So it is black play an important part. Uh, through trade, not necessarily through warfare, because uh, Islam was spread not necessarily by the sword. It was never spread by the sword. It was spread more by learning, by knowledge, and also by faith. Mm. Uh, yeah. So in essence, the, the, the Islamic crescent essentially enlightens a culture. And at the same time, it accelerates the adoption of knowledge and wellness in that sense. Yes, it does, especially um, when the adoption of the Arabic script or the Jawi script um, was... Uh, I think that, that was a, a, a unifying factor because when the Malay started to use Jawi, the entire Malay world practically used it uh, well, previously, we have uh, we have Palavi, we have Sanskrit, we have the Javanese script, we have the Uji script, so we have like half a dozen different scripts. But the arrival of uh, Islam to the Arab and the Arabic script, the Yawi, is actually a unifying factor that unites it. So, um, the, the, the academic, so called academic uh, Malay world. Um, there is some uh, some uh, comments on our uh, YouTube stream that your voice is not very clear. Not clear. Yeah, not very clear. Um, yeah, I think. Um, so while pa uh, Pak Kunara is adjusting the volume, I'll just read out some of the uh, comments here so that we can uh, address this in our Q&A session after this. Are you sounding better, Pak Kunara? Can you try to say a few words? Okay, well, how, how's, this? how's this? Much better. Is it better? A lot better. All right, then. So much clearer. Good. Okay, for you guys who are listening, can you inform us whether you are hearing this clearly? Any one of you who was watching? I know you're watching. There are 13 of you. All right, so one of the question was, uh, tak ada ke pihak nak ambil balik sejarah kita di luar negara Artifak undang-undang bertulis Meriam sampai bila negara luar simpan kazarah negara kita So for those of you who don't understand Malay Essentially um, Izon Syed uh, asked whether is there any initiatives To bring back our artifacts and basically our historical findings from abroad um, As a general uh, statement a lot of our uh, artifacts are actually being brought out of the country so if you go to the museum, you may not see the full picture. It's not even the tip of the iceberg. So uh, let's move on to our docket here. So everyone is commenting clear, much better, very clear. So thank you very much on that. So, so the Islamic Crescent is uh, basically what we believe is the accelerator of civilizations, as evident here as what Pak Kunara has mentioned earlier. The invention 
or the adapt adoption of the Jawi script became the unifying factor over this region across multiple dialects and possibly multiple languages. Yes. Mm. So, uh, Pak Kunara, this is an image, uh, one of the early illustrations uh, to depict Malacca in 1509. This is from a Portuguese source. Uh, essentially, it's from the book called The Book of Duer uh, Duarte Barbosa. Uh, this is published in 1918. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to, to get your, uh, your feedback or rather your interpretation of the scenery that's depicted here. Okay. Um, when you look at this, uh, this, this drawing, this picture, uh, it actually contradicts what uh, Malaysians or, or um, in the Malaysian concept, okay, context, what uh, Malaysian students have been taught about Malacca. I don't know about other countries, but in our own country, We've been told that Malacca was a small fort made of wood and uh, people living in wooden houses. But the depiction here clearly shows that they had stone walls. They had uh, tall buildings and they had even elephants. So elephants uh, back then were considered um, sort of a luxury item. Okay, not just anybody can, can uh, ride elephants. So... The depiction here shows a rather metropolitan view of Malacca, not like the so-called small village um, idea that was planted into most uh, people during the uh, So this is, uh, is something that, that we should uh, we should adapt to. I think we should change the view of what Malacca used to be mm -hmm. into something that goes uh, further down this line. Mm. I would like to bring attention to there are some children here which really shows how safe even by the coast of Malacca. Yes. And not only that, the, the, the elephants, and if, if I notice, because I'm an archer personally, I love archery, every other person is holding a bow on their shoulders. So that means um, archery was uh, popular in Malacca back then. I believe it was just a tool, just an everyday tool, like how we bring handphones ev everywhere nowadays. The bow is one of an mm -hmm. essential tool. Just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I believe so. However, uh, what we can see now is that in modern culture, this is how the Malay world is represented like. Strong, powerful, with powerful cannons, trying to wait off the inventions of a foreign fleet. However, this is not made by a Malaysian film company or any of the regions that speaks <laughs> Malay, unfortunately. This, this, uh, scene, this scene is basically uh, a still capture from the movie called Queens of Lankasuka. It was produced by, Thai, uh, by a Thai film company and their depiction of the Malay people, in my personal opinion, transcends anything that we have ever produced. That's my personal opinion. What do you think, Pak Kunara? Yeah, I tend to agree with you because um, even our own uh, production of uh, uh, epic Malay movies uh, for example Putri Gunung Ledang, I think that's the most uh, contemporary epic that we have mm. um, Harlan shows Malacca as uh, having you know technological advancements like cannons and uh, the, some of the uh, the warriors were in armor, so uh, this is a more I would say, even though it is uh, that there are a few a few missing or misconceptions about the scene, but generally this was what uh, Malacca would have looked like when the Portuguese came. Mm. In mm -mm -mm. And I I like to to comment a bit on this movie. I think because of the heavy Thai influence, you end up seeing uh, a Malay, uh, a, a, assumably a Malay character, the, the the Prince of Pahang, was actually wearing plate armor. Which, yes. Uh, which came actually from, from the Thais, because the Thais has close relations with the West and they actually inter uh, uh, incorporated plate armor. But Pahang and Thailand is quite far away. so Yeah. <laughs> so perhaps those well, are the... Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, about that. Um, actually, during that time or any other time, 
for that matter. In the Malay world, we did not uh, wear solid plates. Okay, for the simple reason that uh, it was too hot to have to be wearing solid plate armor. And uh, let alone standing there, but you have to fight in it. So, mm. solid plate is heavy, it is hot, it uh, limits movement somewhat. So, that's why um, if, we, if we look at, um, say, 19th or 18th century examples that still exist, there are mainly chain mail with small plates. Mm. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was more practical for, for our region actually mm. and, uh, I think the the play armor in the movie was uh, that was a cinematic call <laughs> so just to make, it, <laughs> to make it look more you know to make the the, the Malays look stronger you know, to, mm. to, to, to improve some sort of uh, power Mm-mm-mm. but in practicality um, I think it was far from that Mm-mm-mm. And in reality, in reality, it was far from that. Um, perhaps they would assume that because they they feature the Malay people using uh, uh akabuzias, they are using the the lela rentakers. They would assume the plate armor is supposed to withstand bullets like the round the round ball bullets, like what the Japanese would use for their ashigarus. Well, actually, plate armor. Uh, you know, the decline of plate armor was due to firearms. Mm. So, um, the invention of firearms and the widespread use of firearms, including uh, smaller caliber uh, muskets and pistols, was the reason that, uh, you know, the knights ditched the armor mm. and, and went for lighter protection. Mm-hmm. And actually, they, they, they couldn't really defend against bullets back then. Mm, 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 mm. Some armors were thick enough to stop certain uh, caliber bullets, but then you sacrifice the uh, the weight and the maneuverability for that. Mm. Yeah, that that is uh, evidently very very true, because if if let's say the the Malay people did not adopt mm-hmm. firearms that early, that means we will have more evidence of armor if they are still on yeah. Malay weapons. That that would be a and, very and, Sorry. Yeah, that 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 will be that's true, and uh, also the geographical uh, factor, mm. because uh, we we have uh, arid fields, we have uh, oceans, rivers, so we have lots of uh, bodies of water, mm. which uh, coincidentally do not uh, you know work well with solid plate armor. You become an anchor. So if, uh, <laughs> yeah, unless you want to become an anchor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's look into the fighting style and equipment. We have already established the world that we are talking about, the people that we are talking about, the culture that we are focusing on. So yeah. here I have four uh, very distinct images of the fighting style and the equipments used. The first picture is a picture uh, uh, of a battle between the ties, where you there is there is a depiction of. Uh, elephant versus elephants, like in the in the Western Front or in in World War Two, you have the tank versus tank battles. This one you have the yeah. epic elephant versus elephants battle right here. Uh, perhaps you want to comment a bit on the use of elephants in warfare. Okay, um, back then elephants were practically the main battle tanks of the day. So elephants, uh, they were used. Firstly, to break up ranks, okay, because practically they are they are practically unstoppable. And uh, if you look at um, Indian uh, kingdoms, their elephants were armored, so it, it's practically a walking tank, uh, like uh, in ATAT in uh, Star Wars, for example. <laughs> My pedal tank. <laughs> so the ATAT in Star Wars plays the same. Uh, role as the elephants did uh, 600 years ago. Mm. So, yeah, elephant against elephant is practically tank against tank uh, battle. And uh, elephants could carry up to, I would say, uh, five or six people mm-hmm. on their backs in uh, in uh, protective uh, structures. 
Mm -hmm. And normally they would have uh, they would have archers in there with uh, javelins as well. And uh, I remember seeing somewhere there was an illustration of uh, a small uh, swivel gun mounted mm. onto the elephant uh, structure. Mm -mm -mm. And and they must have really trained these elephants not to get spooked easily because elephants get spooked easily. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, it is interesting to know. Uh, to note that uh, one of the skills of the Malay, olden Malay people were to tame elephants. Mm -hmm. <coughs> These, uh, what we call, uh, pawang gajah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So we have the, the elephant whisperers here, native here. Yes. These people were so uh, in touch with the elephant they practically bonded with the elephants. They can command the elephants to do anything. Mm. You know, the elephants uh, practically believed them or trusted them. Mm. And they would just obey the command of the elephant whisperer, so to say. Mm. Mm. And I would believe that the, the Malay people have been using uh, elephants even way before antiquities. Because um, from what I understand, this particular warfare technique is... Uh, can be found also evident in the Indian cultures, especially in the South. Yes. Mm. And uh, perhaps one of the reasons why the elephant was used right, rather than other animals because, first of all, it was the largest land animal that you can find. Mm. And secondly, it's, uh, it's mobile in practically any situation except maybe going uphill mm. or maybe going across the sea. But other than that, you know, the elephant is sort of an ATV. Mm. You can go anywhere. Mm, 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 and you can carry boats as well. So it, it, it was a practical uh, solution for many things, for, for logistics even as well. Mm, mm. I mean, in this sense, it not only serves as a war machine, it also serves as a development development machine as well because the elephant was used to build the, the stockaders, the, it was built to yeah, gather yeah. trunks and everything else. So it's more like yes. a bulldozer, a multi-purpose vehicle. Yes, it was, it was like that. You know, the elephant was, uh, was a sort of a multi-purpose uh, vehicle that was used in peace to build and as well in war for fighting, for mm. battles. Mm, 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 mm. <clears throat> and in regards to this, there was even some some uh, punishments in the ancient kingdoms where they used elephants to trample uh, uh, basically criminals. Mm. I, th I think that shows how close the elephants is yes. to the Malay people. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in, in this book, yeah. uh, there was a note, uh, observation by the Portuguese that during uh, this, the siege of, uh, or rather the, the assault of Laka, Battle of Laka, some of the war elephants were mounted with long blades on their tusks. Mm. So that means uh, rather than just to trample the enemy, they can also you know, swing their heads from side to side and just practically cut into the enemy line. Mm, so if we were to relate to this, it would be like a scene from Lord of the Rings. Yes. <laughs> mm, where the orcs are running uh, are running everywhere and people are running from the elephants and then one Malay archer yeah. would climb the elephant and shoot it down like Legolas. <laughs> <laughs> it could have happened. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it could have happened. It could have happened. Anything, anything is possible. It could have happened. <laughs> mm. And then the second picture here is more similar to the Queens of Lankasuka scene, where we, there's, there's, a, there's a picture of a stockade. This was done by our local mm -hmm. Malaysian artists, depicting the mm -hmm. defenders uh, bombarding the, the, the blockades of Portuguese ships. And mm -hmm. I would like to put into uh, focus here, this mm -hmm. is a depiction of a typical Malay jong, which is mm -hmm. huge and way bigger than whatever the Portuguese had when they came invading. Yep. And over here, I want to show uh, what we discussed earlier on using a uh, solid plate armor. The Portuguese uh, accounts have shown that this actually limits movement and restricts their landing on shore. That's why they, most of the time yeah. they're at sea, bombarding from afar. Yeah. You see, uh, in, in the last uh, depiction, you can clearly see that the, uh, the Portuguese were depicted as wearing only chest plates, not the whole suit. 
Mm. So uh, and some some did not even wear helmets. Mm. So that means they, they wanted to reduce the weight of the armor so that they can come ashore more, uh, more easily compared to you know, being in full plate armor. If they had full harness on, I'm sure the moment they set foot on the beach, they'll be they're sunk. <laughs> That's but right. They can sink into the water and and Malacca would just have to just stand there and wait. They'll all die <laughs> of. Uh, I think they they'll all yeah. drown in the sea. <laughs> That's why I, th- I think if if let's say the siege lasted a little bit longer, they will probably die of starvation or scurvy on on, on the boats because they can't land. Yes, that that is a possibility as well, provided <laughs> that the boats uh, still float by then. <laughs> okay, this is just a depiction. Uh, this is uh, uh, I derived this from Malacca Kini. This is a depiction mm-hmm. based on the calculations of the mass and from the uh, historical accounts of the Mendam Barahi. One of the biggest ships yeah. antiquities have ever seen. Perhaps you can share some insights on this one. Okay, the Mandar Brahi was said to be, like you said, uh, one of the biggest uh, ships in antiquity. Uh, she was uh, basically like an aircraft carrier of today mm. in terms of size compared to other ships. And uh, when you compare, uh, I I seem to remember a, a, a Dutch account uh, when they wanted to attack Aceh. Mm. This was like uh, was it a uh, hundred years after Malacca. Mm. Uh, they did not manage to get through because the Achinis had ships that were taller than their masts. <laughs> that means the Portuguese, the, the Portuguese uh, sails were, you know, did not even reach the deck of the Aceh ships. So mm. how were you supposed to, to, to even board those giants, those leviathans? Mm. And uh, it is said that the ship's walls were made of four layers of wood. Mm. And the, the Dutch cannons can only penetrate up to two. So... Mm. It was uh, it was similar to what happened to the Yamato in uh, World War Two, I suppose. It's a floating fortress in the sense. It's a floating fortress in sense, yes. Mm-mm-mm. So Nabrahi was was that it was a floating. She was a floating fortress. Mm. But um, one question comes to mind though: mm. Where was Nabrahi during the Portuguese attack? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So shall we shall we keep that question for another session then? Because the, again, that one will sure. not stop. <laughs> because if sure, we start sure, down sure. the road of naval warfare of the Malay world, we won't stop. Yep. <laughs> we, can, we can do another session on naval warfare next. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we have a few questions here that we would like to address first. Uh, first okay. of all, um, do Malay have horse cavalry? Um. Yes, but. Uh, the the horse cavalry was mainly uh, skirmish uh, units. You know, they just go in and come out, go in and come out. They did their fast um, hit and run uh, units. So uh, they they were not really the main force. The main force was the elephants. Mm. The elephants were the main battle tanks. So these guys were like um, armored personnel carriers, so to say, of the day. Mm. So they just uh, go in, wreak havoc, and come out. Mm. But uh, they were available in in uh, limited numbers due to the as I said again the uh, ge- geographical uh, factors of uh, this area because we didn't we didn't have like very wide fields where we can use um, lots of cavalry we can do the cavalry charge we we couldn't really do that because of the limitations of the uh, the geography of the area. Mm. So that's why elephants were, were more important than horses. We did have horses. Not not to say that we didn't have horses. We did have horses. But they were not the the major part of the of the army, so to mm. say. It's more of a specialized unit, wouldn't it be? Yes, yes. It's so more of a specialized unit used for uh, lightning fast attacks, uh, mm. hit and run attacks. Um, horseback 
archery. I'm sure you're aware of that. Yeah, yeah. And um, also uh, warriors or um, warriors on horseback were those who used swords. Mm. They will have a long bladed weapon, spears, swords, yep. lances. Spears and swords, lances, arrows and arrows. Mm. You couldn't really use a parang when you're on horseback. It doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> okay. Um, we, that question just now was from uh, Shad Li Shan. And the next oh, okay. question would be from Muhammad Benjamin. Uh, war elephants mm-hmm. served as main battle tank. Is there any support elements associated with the war elephants? <clears throat> support elements, uh, okay, I think uh, I just mentioned the horses. And uh, other than that, uh, it's the artillery. So the artillery, um, and then the infantry, of course. Mm. Um, we didn't have armored infantry. Our infantry were mainly light infantry, armed with uh, spears and shields, and uh, maybe the the commanders were the ones who were on the horses. Mm. Or the yeah. elephants, in this sense. Or the elephants. Mm, 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 I think there were horses as well in between that because, you know, the commander needed to issue orders, so he had to be visible. Mm, if he was mm, among the known men, then uh, this could be a bit hard to do. Mm, so, mm, um, it would have been possible for him to be on a horse mm-hmm. so that he can issue orders easily. Okay. Understandable. I think it, it, it makes basically make, it makes total sense that way. It's just logical mm-hmm. thinking in that aspect, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have yep. a comment here. Is this guy even know about Malay naval warfare? Honestly, I don't. But this is a discussion topic where we welcome your input and your insights. If you have the knowledge and you have the references <laughs> to cover, we will be glad to host you here and we can talk together and discuss together as a community. So I think that covers... <laughs> Sorry, Pat Kunera, what was that? Sure thing. I mean, uh, we we would really appreciate uh, not just comments but also some input. If if you were to say you have some knowledge on uh, naval warfare, then please, by all means, share it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we are open to criticism, requests, and whatever. Not we are very positive here, and we're just here to yeah. discuss, and we're not here to lecture. So feel free. All right, so we'll uh, last question here before we move on to the next segment, which is, could you explain about Mat- Malay ba- Battle Formation from Muhammad Benjamin? Malay Battle Formations. Okay, uh, referring to this again, uh, from the Portuguese accounts. <clears throat> okay, when you talk about battle formations, the only way that you could have a battle formation is for uh, open warfare, right? So, in an open field, you can have a formation. But, as I've said before, this is not really possible in our area. So, um, due to the geographical factors, we have forests, we have jungles, we have rivers and swamps, mm-hmm. paddy fields. So, uh, our battle tactics were slightly different from the from what we are used to seeing in, in uh, western depictions and uh, also western tactics we did not have like you know back then they had long lines of uh, infantry and then the cavalry would charge in and then, no, we didn't really have that so the battle formation would have been units of um, uh, shall I say guerrilla warfare commandos Okay, we we will have small commando units that infiltrate the enemy enemy lines, mm-hmm. attack, and then return, attack and return. So that was the the Malay style of uh, combat. We didn't go in full force and then strength get stranded there. Mm. So uh, in terms of formation, I would say we did not really have a, a proper formation as in the Western concept of battle formation. Mm-mm-mm. But if you're talking about battle units, yes, we we did have uh, organized uh, military units. Mm. So practically every kampung is um, what's the equivalent of uh, military unit nowadays? A company. Mm. One kampung is one company. So the the, the leader, the pengulu, 
is the leader of that company. So nowadays that would be the captain. So um, and uh, several kampung come under one uh, general mm-hmm. or the nubalang or the panglima, and that's how it was. That, that was the structure. Mm. And this panglima answer directly to the uh, laksmana, the the general, the the, the field marshal. Mm. So we had that the command structure was there. Mm. Okay, but in terms of uh, battle formation, a field formation, not so much. Mm. So they have uh, basically functions of units, but not essentially a physical layout like a chessboard in that kind of interpretation. Yes, yes. Mm. This will also go ties uh, uh, very closely with the fighting styles and the equipments used. So essentially, yes. here I have a, a, a few accounts. This is from uh, Sumatra, from Indonesia. Again, another Malay Malay world. And uh, what is interesting for me to note here you know, on the left side. You see spears. You see the. Uh, you see some uh, bladed weapons. You see a sling, and most importantly, you see a firearm. Yep. So in this connotation, we are trying. Uh, what I am trying to put forth is, uh, some of the people here in Malaysia ask, "What is the Malay bow? How come we have no instances of the Malay people using bows and arrows?" Well, my first initial response to that, uh, a more of a general statement, is that is because the Malays adopted firearm much earlier than the rest of the world. The bow and arrow has became antiquity, whereas the firearm became the main weapon of choice in terms of range. And for this, uh, I would also like to uh, note that the Malay firearms has gone to a level that we have our own book on firearms. That is written yes, yes. in Jawi text, and here we can see a, a much more recent uh, image. It will be on the eighteenth or eighteen uh, hundred picture, if I'm not mistaken. This is from the Philippines, the Southern Philippines. I'm not too sure, so I'm just uh, trying to make sure here with you, just to confirm it. Uh, the the head gear looks Ache to me, mm. uh, and also the this uh, his his sidearm is. Uh, it looks like a it looks like an Ache, Achenese weapon. Mm. Yep. But what I I notice here that he's holding a buckler as well. Mm-hmm. So the buckler would have been used. Okay, first of all, we need to understand that even though firearms uh, offer longer range, uh, their main drawback back then was the reload time. So, um, these guys had to have a secondary weapon. And in this case, that looks like a Sikin. So, a Sikin is basically an Ache sword. Uh, Sikin would have been used once, you know, you fired a shot and if you did not have time to reload, you just drop the rifle or drop the gun and draw out your your sword. Mm. Basically, that's why the weapon is there. Mm. So, uh, that was used, uh, that was the strategy. Mm. Unless you have time to reload, then uh, the firearm would have been used again. Mm. So um, I have not really fired an antique firearms, but uh, my friends who have done so uh, told me that it takes about five to ten minutes to reload. Mm. Because you have to break so, open the powder, you have to slot it in, yeah. then you have to put mm-hmm. the cloth in, ramp it up again. There's yep. a lot of steps involved, but what I like to note yep. here is that the, the Malay people have compiled these steps in this manuscript in a form of an artistic mm-hmm. interpretation and recitation. So it becomes almost mm-hmm. like a, a more of a poetry in a, in a sense, an instructional poetry on just how yep. to use the, the, the weapons of that time. And what I like to highlight here is that the ability of the Malay people to take something so mundane, such as a manual, this is essentially a user manual, and make it artistic. <laughs> yep. That gives us... And, uh, yeah. Go ahead. On, on uh, the, another note, uh, I recall this uh, this ancient text called the Pluru Petunang. Okay, Pluru Petunang is a, it's an ancient manuscript uh, which emphasizes, among other things, on accuracy. Mm. So, 
I think this is where you know this is where the Malays make up for the slow rate of fire. They make sure that whenever they shoot, they will hit something. Mm. So that th- that is why they had all these uh, user manuals and, and, and all sorts of things so that they wanted to make sure that you know, when you shoot, you hit something. So when you hit something, that means that it affects the enemy. Then mm. you have time to reload. Mm. So it's no point that you just shoot blindly. You cannot hit anything. And then the enemy keeps coming. When are you going to reload? So what? what's the point of having a firearm there? Mm. So essentially, even the the people of the of the Malay the the Malays basically back then they are aware of the triangle of power, accuracy, and speed. So in order yes. to overcome speed issue, they make sure their accuracy is high and the power is high because their badil is very big. Yep. So essentially, that shows even way before that the Malay people are tactical minded. So it's not. Yes. It's not just a, a, a rambling band of amok monkeys to say to uh, just to nope. give an understanding. <laughs> so these are the kind of things that we can interpret from what little resources we have back on the Malay people or the Malay race in the Malay world. So can you imagine if we are able to acquire more heritage and more of these artifacts back? We can learn so much more. Yes, indeed. Um, it shows that the Malays were actually a very tactical uh, people. They, they, they're not just like you said, rambling uh, amok monkeys. No, uh, we were we were very civilized. Okay? We were very um, very advanced in our way because you cannot compare the advancements in Malay culture to other cultures because. That would be like comparing, uh, say, uh, a cat to a fish. So uh, the cat can run on land, the fish cannot cannot you know, walk on land, or the fish cannot climb a tree. So are you saying that a fish is... Uh, Stupid. <laughs> Stupid, yeah. <laughs> well, what happens if you put a cat in the water? Mm, so, so the argument has... At, yeah, go ahead. To, to look at the... Um, uh, to look at how how to appreciate the culture, you have to look at the culture from within. You know, from from the culture side, not from an observation from a, from an outside observer's uh, view. You mm. have to go into the culture. No. Mm. So if, if here, basically, the perspective that you have to put forth is you have to dig deeper because this is barely the tip. Yes, yes. This is just barely. It's not. The tip is barely the tip. <laughs> it's barely the tip more. of the tip. <laughs> yeah, it's the tip of the tip. There's, there's a lot more to the blue than that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so just uh, just now we 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 will, we will stop here. Basically, the items that was used. So this is from uh from Sumatra, that shows the inner mm-hmm. workings of the the system that is used in the firearm. And over here, if I am not wrong, this could be a piston. Hmm. Down here, a piston, mm-hmm. a fire yeah. piston. Yes, yes, yes. It looks like it. So essentially, we are not people who use flints or wood to rub sticks together. We actually invented an entirely new invention, which is the fire piston, to make sure mm-hmm. that these musketeers, uh, so to speak, have an accessible fire source immediately because it uses friction and vacuum to create ember. Hmm. So I think that is the modern day lighter and probably he would use this to light his rokok daun maybe as well. <laughs> because of course we are also affected by the tobacco trade through the trade routes. Yeah. Okay. And the rokok daun may, may have been used to light his musket as well. Yeah, that could be <laughs> true. That could be true. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are a few more questions but we will hold that until we finish just the equipments because we're just going to run through this. Uh, this is something uh, more, uh, I would say, closer to you. Yeah. Maybe you can share a bit <laughs> on the role of this particular item. Okay, I think uh, by now, everybody who's watching this would know that those are Chris. Okay. So, the Chris is uh, practically the Malay weapon. So, whenever you see a Chris, you do not associate it with any other race in the world but Malays. Um, and looking at 
the various uh, types of grace that we have, that means, you know, when a culture has so many designs on one particular weapon, that means they are a very advanced uh, culture. You know, they have even for a grace, there are hundreds of different designs and uh, coming from different uh, different regions of the Malay world. Mm-hmm. And uh, for a Malay to be without a grace is something odd. Mm. It, it was an oddity. But up to the, if I'm not mistaken, 16th or 17th uh, century, mm-hmm. uh, not everybody was allowed to wear a grace. Mm. Was, uh, there was an edict by uh, one of the, Malay, uh, the Malacca sultans saying that only certain people were allowed to wear grace because the grace uh, back then was a badge of rank and it was uh, bestowed onto the person by the sultan. But we see towards the end of the 18th and uh, in the 19th century, practically everybody wears a grace. So uh, when rebels uh, came to... to <coughs> essentially what they call Malaya back then. Hmm. Um, he noted that everybody from boys to old uh, old men all had grace on the uh, on their belts. And uh, after studying the grace for about five years in 1878, uh, I think, towards the end of the 19th century, he decided to outlaw the wearing of the grace. Because uh, perhaps he, he found uh, something important uh, re- regarding the grace to the Malays. So, mm. okay, only the Sultan and the four of his men can wear grace. No one else could. Mm. Uh, it, could that be an attempt you know, to nullify the Malay culture in that sense, to distance the Malays from their from their heritage? Yes, yes. Mm. That was part of the idea. Mm. So, uh, from then onwards, we have been uh, alienated by you know th- these uh, these people. We don't we view the grace in a different manner. Some consider the grace as the evil uh, with a spiritual or uh, paranormal uh, properties. And uh, during uh, Raffles time, a lot of them got destroyed thrown away or taken away and it was worse during Japanese occupation okay, during Japanese occupation anybody found the grace was executed mm. so that's when our grandfathers practically buried or throw away their grace mm. See, which, is, uh, which is a great loss to us today because I'm sure you know uh, even during the, the siege of uh, Blatter, the Portuguese the Dutch, they brought back uh, an immense amount of grace. <clears throat> they took the best of what we had and took it back to their country, and uh, which is hardly accessible nowadays to even our own people. Mm. And uh, it's a shame, actually. Yeah. It's a very tragic incident to to speak. Mm-hmm. And these are some illustrations mm-hmm. of the uh, the Chris. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, an account from Indonesia. Yeah, it looks like it. Mm. And perhaps this is something much closer to you, the Malay sword. Ah. <laughs> Maybe you can enlighten mm-hmm. some of our viewers on this particular diagram. It has been circulating on, in social media, so perhaps we can have a brief overview and snapshot of what this is all about. Okay, uh, this is actually my attempt at uh, classifying Malay sword types. Uh, in uh, European swords, we have the one of the typologies that we have is the oak shot typology. So he divided the uh, different shapes of the European sword into types, uh, say 10, 11, 12, and so on. So what I try to, to emulate here is to differentiate or to, to um, classify the different types of Malay swords. So if you look there, you can see type 1A, 1B, and 1C. These are all, uh, they, had, they have the same type of hilt. Mm. Uh, 
Incidentally, when naming a Malay weapon, Malays tend to refer to the hilt uh, as well. So a certain type of hilt uh, refers to a certain type of weapon. And the combination of the hilt and the blade will determine what it is. So uh, type 1 is basically what we call, uh, on our side, we call it pedang, pedang kara because of the hilt. The hilt looks like a, a carving of a Makara, the uh, ancient sea dragon, or the it was also the, the symbol of the uh, Sivijaya uh, kingdom, <clears throat> uh, symbol of maritime power. Okay, so if you look at type 1A, the blade tends to be, uh, the tip of the blade goes down. Okay, type 1B, tip of the blade goes up. Type 1C has a spear point. So, Actually, um, in Sumatra, they call these klewang. Okay, these are called klewang. The one with the tip uh, going down is uh, from Lombok. The one with the tip going up, that one is more of a northern to central, central to northern uh, Sumatran region. And the one with the spear tip, that is actually taken from a... Dutch or European saber blade mounted onto a Makara hilt. Mm. So these are the different types of uh, Makara sword or Klewang. And then uh, type 2 there is uh, what we would call the Jinawi. Jinawi is basically a two-handed sword, single-edged, uh, uh, with a long blade. Okay, the definition of sword here is that the blade needs to be at least 23 to 25 inches long. Mm. So anything shorter than that, we do not refer to it as a sword. But nowadays, you know, anything looks like a sword, people call it sword. So this is what I'm trying to, to clarify. Not everything that looks like a sword is a sword. Mm. Okay, so um, type 2 is a Jedawi. Type 3, there's A and B there. Mm -hmm. 3 is what we call the Penangkas. Okay, the Chenangkas um, is some called a toa, which is a misnomer. It's not a toa. Mm. You see, a toa and a pulwa and a Chenangkas are three different uh, types of sports. Uh, but they look similar. So the Malay type is the Chenangkas. And they have come in either straight, double-edged, or slightly curved, uh, single-edged uh, blades. So that's uh, type 3 and 3A and B. <clears throat> and then we have uh, type 4. 4A is what you call a typical uh, that is the buaya berenang. Yeah, buaya berenang. Yep, okay. The, there are two types of buaya berenang. There's a quarter version and a longer version. The longer version is what we call the pedang buaya berenang. Okay, that with this type uh, 4A. And we have 4B, which is known as uh, Pedang Melayu. Pedang Melayu has a, does not have the, what we call the false edge of the element, uh, the, the, the head of the crocodile at the end there. So mm. it's just a straight uh, blade, mm. slightly curved usually. So that, that is the type uh, 4B. Then the type 5 is what most people nowadays call a pedang. It's only got 21 inch blade. It's, it's actually a short version of the buaya berenang and uh, some would call it parang panjang. You see, the, the shorter versions should be called parang, not actually pedang. Mm. And then we have, uh, that was type 5, type 6 is uh, Sikin. Sikin, yeah? yeah. Sikin, okay. Sikin is an Achinese uh, sword. They also come in, in various types of blades and some curve. Most, yeah, most are straight. Some are curved. Mm. And then we go to type uh, it was type 6. We have type 7. I put it in Nabo, but recently I found that um, they have a different name for it. Actually, Nabo is not accurate. We've been calling it Nabo because everybody calls it Nabo. So uh, this is a type of sword from Bajar Masin. Mm. Um, and then we have uh, type 8. Type 8 is a Alamein. Alamein is a Buddhist sword. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then type 9. Type 9 is a 
is what we call pedang belut. Pedang belut is uh, is it yes? Yeah, I get him with me. This came from Pahang. Okay, it's a single single handed sword with a blade that is it's about an inch wide all the way to the end. Mm-hmm. So the blade is uh, 26 inches long. So this is actually a sword. This is a sword. Okay, even though it's, it looks like a simple, it looks like a parang or a golo, but the length of the blade, the width of the blade makes it a sword. So this is only nine types that have been able to identify. But this was, uh, this diagram was made last year. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, an updated version of it, which will be released uh, soon, and maybe you know certain uh, additions to it because uh, we've uh, verified that the Janawi is not just that. Mm-hmm. There is another version of the Janawi, a straight bladed sword. Actually, it's also called Janawi, mm-hmm. but it's from a different region. It's from uh, the southern region of the Malay. The Malay world. So they have a straight version of, of a straight sword, a single or two handed, and they call it Jinawi as well. So, see, this is uh, the issue of uh, nomenclature of weapons in the Malay world. The Sumatrans call that a Kelewang, but in in uh, Kelantan, Kelewang means a different thing, totally different. And yep, in yep. Java, Kelewang is actually a uh, Kelewang. Okay, hold on. So we'll probably have a special treat here, but Kunara wants to take an actual Kelewang. This is also called a Kelewang. Okay, some of you who call this a pirate sword. Okay. <laughs> But this is what they call a Dutch Klewang. So this is one form of Klewang. And then we have another Klewang here, which is uh, the Sumatran version. Okay, this is the apparently type uh, 1B. Okay, this is also called a Klewang. So what can you do with this? They're totally, two, they're totally different weapons. You know, with the same name. See, this is the issue that we have when naming Malay weapons. So, um, I decided to take a, a more, um, shall we say, a tolerant approach. And um, in the case of the Janawi, I call the this type, the type 2, as a, the northern Janawi, because it's mainly found in the north. And the Banjamasin Janawi, Banja, Janawi Banja, is called the, the southern Janawi. Mm. So I hope that that term can be accepted, because it makes it easier for us to discuss weapons. Mm. Okay. So basically, that's it. Um, there, there will be an updated version of this uh, chart. And there is also another version of this chart which uh, shows the development of swords. Mm, that would be very interesting. The, yeah, it's from the um, 5th century BC until now. Okay, ah, uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about. The Chanankas and the Tolwa. Totally two different types of sword. Mm. They're, not, they're not the same. The, the Tolwa comes from India. Yeah. Chanankas is a new weapon. Mm. And then we have a uh, pala or a Turkish sword. Mm-hmm. And we have the 1796. Uh, 1796, yes. 1796, Calvin uh, Sabre, which is uh, British. Mm. So if, you, if you're not into detail, you would say they're all sorts. They all look the same. Mm. But actually, it is the details that tell the difference between each type of sword and where they come from. Because... These four swords come from four different corners of the world. Mm. They're not even, not even neighbours, you know? Yeah, it's too far. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, perhaps we can uh, wait in, uh, in uh, wait for the updated version of basically the anatomy and the types of the Malay swords. I think that'll be a very interesting document to look at. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, and the next... <laughs> Sorry? 
uh, we're still working on that. So uh, because new information keeps coming in, mm. because uh, even even though we don't have much written uh, resources, but uh, we have lots of verbal accounts. Mm. So the more people I meet and the more people who come to me and and uh, wish to discuss swords, uh, the more information I get, and. Uh, As I get these uh, information, mm-hmm. and uh, as I verify them, I will put them into the chart. So I hope to um, assimilate all of these types of swords into one chart, so that we can tell the difference between the different types of Malay swords and where they come from, which mm. region. I think that be a yeah. very useful information to set. I would say an academic discussion on the subject, as opposed to I say you say. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, looking forward to that. And the next one will be about the the bows of the Malay bow. So I I have a lot of people asking like, what is the Malay bow? How does the Malay bow look like? I would reach. I would re- respond to that. Um, we do know what is used in the Malay world in general. Um, here I have a picture from the Grayson collection of the British Museum collection. It is an Indonesian horn bow, where the entire bow is made from horn. So that oh. that tells us that hey, does that mean the Malay people has been using horns for bow making? Definitely, the Javanese did, because this is a very uh, clear account of the uh, of an existing artifact for a working bow. So this clearly shows that there is a link there. There is a very clear evidence that the bow and arrow was definitely used here. Yes, yes. Uh, do you know when this uh, this bow was made? What, what, what time? What time? Timeline did it come from? Uh, based on the design itself, it is based from uh Raffles eighteen seventeen. Ah. Yeah. So. Okay. It, it could be a lot earlier as well, but I couldn't verify the the sources and the citations, so I wouldn't want to confuse our audience. This is more of yes. a general discussion of yes, it exists. So this particular one is made out of horn. Then I do have some attempts of myself making bows from rattan, because I believe ah. rattan is a very durable material. It is very, uh, it is available in in our region, and it is being traded globally ever since before Malacca times. So I experimented on this using the design that was uh, derived from from Raffles eighteen seventeen and Grayson, and. It seems to be working in a sense that the grip of the bow itself is rounded. It's very unlike uh, Turkish bows or even uh, I would say the Chinese bows. It's a very distinctive design choice for this particular weapon. And if I look into the types of equipment that was used by a Javanese soldier, it suddenly makes sense. The bow is a practical equipment, whereby the handle is reminiscent to all the other tools in his repertoire of weapons. So that's one thing. It could be because of the universal uh, easiness to use it, the universal easiness to manufacture it, and it could possibly also be that the bow and arrow at this time could also be a tool. It's essentially a survival tool. And a tool for success, essentially. Just like mm-hmm. nowadays, we are bringing handphones and everything. The bow and arrow was a tool back then, but this could be a very, I would say, someone who is of royalty or someone who has a status to be carrying bows like this. Uh, but yes, yes. I would like to highlight these ones that was found in uh, Southern Philippines. This is from the U.S. National Museum. These are bows that is made out of rattan. Eh, sorry, from bamboo. Mm-hmm. So over here we already have three materials. We already have the horn. We already have the rattan. We also have the bamboo, which is clearly evident here. These are mainly used by the Negritos, as well as the people and tribal people of Moro, and it shows that these weapons are uh, in modern times Indonesia. They have this jemparing, which essentially looks like a modern recurve bow. Yes, it does. It has all the the riser. You have the limbs, but the yeah. unique thing is they are shooting it seated. Ah. 
So in the I, sorry, using a three finger three finger draw. That's right. That's right. They're using a three finger draw, drawing it back, anchoring it behind their their ears, and they're shooting at a target called the bendolan. Or if not mistaken, it's called the bendolan. People can correct me if I'm wrong. Which is a tube, a white tube with a red dot, which is supposed to resemble the head, the neck, and the body towards the heart. Oh. So again, okay. these I'm not an expert in jemparingan. Perhaps we can get someone who is an expert to talk about it, and will be enlightening, uh, enlightening to all of us. Sure. Okay. So the reason why why we do not see evidence that the Malay bows and arrows are is not very popular, as opposed to the keris or perhaps the spearheads or the arrowheads. Maybe I think because that the Malay people are very ingenious. If they need a bow to hunt. They can make one in the morning, in the afternoon, they are able to shoot already. Yes, it's more of a practicality it's... and our yeah, artistic approach. So when they say, kenapa tak nampak? Busu orang Melayu. For all you know, if they need it, they'll make it because they know how to. And they know what makes make it work and they are, they are much closer to nature. They are much closer to the creator in that sense. Because they are yes. able to do this for survival, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the ultimate reason why, the main reason why you do not see much evidence on the Malay bows and arrows are these things. <laughs> Basically, there goes the neighborhood. Sorry? There goes the neighborhood. <laughs> so basically what I'm saying here is that the Malay people of the Malay world have evolved in terms of their weaponry much earlier and much faster because the bow and arrow became antiquity and the firearm became the primary range or missile weapon of choice. What do you think about so this? <clears throat> okay, so it would seem that the bow and arrow uh, became a tool rather than a weapon. Mm. So they decided to use uh, firearms as the, as a, as a, the main ranged weapon. So the bow and arrow uh, sort of got demoted to just a tool mm. for the Malays to use. Uh, like you said, you know, whenever they want, they can just make one in the morning and use it in the afternoon. But uh, there might have been no war bows uh, as well. But the nature of these uh, bows being made from organic material, mainly, like you said, horn rattan and bamboo, perhaps even wood, they could have not survived, uh, you know, being underground. That's mm, one thing. The elements. Yeah, the elements. They could have also been taken and burnt. Mm. So, they could have been destroyed. Mm, 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 so, um, but, uh, maybe that is uh, the other reason why you can still find firearms instead of the bow and arrows. Mm. Uh, again, um, when we look at firearms, that means that there's definitely a, a strategic advantage you know, at using firearms here. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. um, when we talk about guerrilla warfare, mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe firearms... Uh, were not the ideal weapons to be used during a, a commando raid. Mm. Perhaps during that time, they will switch back to the bows. And uh, according to Portuguese sources, the Malays used bows, slings, and uh, blowguns. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, firearms were, uh, were mainly used for perhaps defending... Uh, the castle, mm. defending the palace, it's defending more ships, urban, urban and naval functions, more of it. Yes, and and they they would have been used on elephants as well because on an elephant you would have had all the time you need to reload mm. a musket, and or you, you can have a, a, a reloader. Mm. You know, a person who reloads the musket for you, you just shoot. Then you give it to him. He and reloads, he reloads it and, and yeah. Reload. So you can maintain a volley as well as be at a height advantage on a horse. Yes, a horse and also the on an, an elephant. Okay, I'll just answer a quick question here. Malay musket rifle using matchlock or flintlock. Well, the Malays are also one of the pioneers of the wheel lock. 
a much more sophisticated invention, if that hopes that answers your question. So in a way, we use all three? Yeah, depending on the mood of the maker, I suppose, or the amount of money paid to him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, that, that, that was just a quick uh, uh, remark. Basically, if you, we want to research more on the match locks and the type of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, the trigger systems of the melee uh, firearms, there is a specific book for that. And uh, we can have a separate session to discuss on that matter. Maybe Pak Kunara can uh, advise some books to, to refer to. Yeah, I uh, happen to have this. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it. Senjata uh, Api Alam Layu by Wan Muhammad. Senjata Api Alam Layu by Wan Muhammad Dasuki Wan Hasbullah. This is a DBP book, Dewan Bahasa book. Mm. So perhaps if you are interested to know more, you can probably check out the Dewan Bahasa Pustaka website and see whether it is available in their catalogue and perhaps you can reach out from there. Yep. Okay, and uh, there are a few more things that is relatable to the, to the combustions of gunpowder is that we do realise that one of the main ingredients for this particular kind of weapon is salt pepper. Mm -hmm. And where else do we get the best salt pepper from? From our elephants. <laughs> so yep. that, that shows the links of how it works and how it really links up together to really show the strength of the Malay speaking people. Mm -hmm. We don't leave anything to waste. Mm -hmm. And this is another interesting one, which is the Lela, the Lela, Lela Rintaka. And if you, if you notice, the design of this particular cannon is mounted on a swivel. Yes. Almost all of it has swivel mounts. And I've seen some pictures that is, uh, that's on social media where someone was using this like a rocket launcher. If they do that, I think they will blow their <laughs> eardrums. <laughs> yes, definitely. I was about to say that. Anyway, um, okay, the term Lela Rentaka is actually two things. Yeah. You know, two types of guns. Yeah. Lela is one thing and Rentaka yeah. is another. Yeah. So uh, some people uh, are confused with this and they call the thing Lela Rentaka. No, it's actually two guns. Mm. The swivel gun is the rentaka. Mm. Well, Lelo is the light cannon. It's, uh, the one at the uh, lower left corner. Yeah, that's a Lelo. Mm. On, and all the others are practically rentaka because they have the swivel mounts. Mm. So swivel guns are called rentaka. The Lelo is a light cannon that is uh, that can be carried by, I think, two men. Mm. You know, they, they are mobile cannons. The Lelo is a mobile cannon. Mm. Well, uh, Mariam is a fixed or a mounted weapon that is uh, normally placed on ships, uh, on fortresses, or uh, they don't move cannons, essentially. Mm. I see. So the Rantaka can be anything from a small caliber cannon to something of a medium caliber weapon. Mm. Uh, that, that is a Rentaka. Definitely, like you said, you know, somebody holding like a rocket launcher, it will <laughs> definitely blow his eardrums out. <laughs> and possibly and, parts of his shoulder and fingers. <laughs> yes. And, and not just that, he will be thrown back maybe like, I don't know, 10, 15 feet. <laughs> when it moves. <laughs> mm, 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 That's the reason why they put on a swivel mount. But this <laughs> also... This also tells us that just now we saw the very uh, magnificent Mandambarahi, but these smaller mm -hmm. cannons can be on our sampans and on our small canoes. Yes, yes, definitely. So perhaps the, the, the better question is that what is the naval formation of the Malay people? Would be a much more interesting proposition. Yes, that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for a ship the size of Mandambarahi, they would definitely have cannons, Maria. Hmm. Definitely. And then they have uh, some Lela the attack will be all over the place, I'm sure. Because uh, these are practically you know, swivel guns, uh, anti-personnel uh, anti weapons. Mm. More, more to shoot down people rather than to destroy boats and ships. Mm. They use the cannons and that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. But this could also tell us if it is small enough, they can have can amass a massive amount of mounted cannon, sh uh, smaller ships. 
and, and basically this can become the support units of the the magnificent mandamarahi so that could be also a few yes. things that we can discuss about uh, uh, on another session yeah something interesting they would be like uh, uh, in the modern flotilla you have the, the main uh, battleship Mm. And then um, you would have the one frigate and the destroyers uh, protecting it. So in uh, ancient uh, Malay warfare, it would have been the same. Mm. You have the mother ship, the big Mandambrahi, for example. Then you, you would have smaller ships uh, and then also even smaller uh, boats that mm. were used to, uh, to, to board enemy vessels. seem to experience a little bit of frame drop on your end. Uh, just to quick, mm -hmm. quickly check, is your battery okay there? Uh, my battery is okay. Okay, so perhaps it's just the connection slightly from this end. Uh, yes, yes. Mm, 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 mm. So in that sense, I think if we were to discuss those elements, it will be again a very long discussion and perhaps we can get some insights from people who actually have uh, more history in maritime warfare yes. and naval warfare Definitely. in this sense. So if um, any of you do know anyone who have who possess this kind of knowledge, who is able to contribute, let us know. Well, we would like to, to have to discuss a chat, uh, to have a discussion or a chat. So let's uh, move, move along here and uh, I would like to show this one ah <laughs> so these are basically armor uh it, it has mm -hmm. a plate and a chain as you mentioned earlier and these yes. come from three different locations within the malay world it came from brunei it also came from the southern philippines and there are some speculations that these ones uh, basically, uh, the next one here, part of it came from Persia and part of it was assembled locally. Perhaps you can give some insights on this, some suggestion or some uh, yeah insights, basically. Okay, um, when talking about armor, uh, not the majority, the majority of the Malay armies did not wear armor, so armor was essentially uh, restricted to a certain class of warriors, uh, the commanders or the generals, so to say. <clears throat> and even then, not every general wore armor. Some did not, some did. So armor was, uh, was actually a luxury to have. Um, and uh, as far as I know, from the, uh, based on, on the, written sources and verbal sources, uh, we have not yet been able to find any manufacturers of chain mail on our side. So it was uh, probably what happened was we imported the chain mail and we, like you said, we assembled it here locally using uh, brass plates, using buffalo horns, uh, even uh, sometimes metal plates, we, we link them together using the basic uh, chainmail shirt, so to say, uh, to form our own uh, unique uh, sort of armor. Mm. Um, and the one that you're showing here is, is a very is a very nice one. It's really nicely made. And looking at the design, it offers both uh, protection and also mobility. 
yeah. as compared to the solid plates uh, that we seen in the movie Queens of Nagasuka. Mm. So if uh, if they dress the Pahang prince in this, that would have been more more logical. realistic, uh. <laughs> More realistic, definitely. Mm. And I noticed, I mean, like, like yourself, you're, you're currently wearing a, a butted male mm-hmm. armor. And I have uh, experience yeah. wearing this before. Essentially, these males with the metal, it actually dissipates heat better, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Especially yes, it does. if we are sweating, we are practicing, and we can actually feel that, eh, tak panas lah. Yes, yes, it kind of cools you down, actually. Yeah, which is, which is quite a surprising uh, thing to feel. Especially when you're very mm-hmm. heavy, you expect to be sweating a lot, but... Not really. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to your solid plates. Yeah, 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 yeah. The ones that you're wearing, mm. I'm sure this is getting warm, man. Eh? For me, it's okay because this is not plate. This is plastic. <laughs> <laughs> so this is basically for all of you watching. This is actually made from HDPE, and it can withstand uh, blows uh, from uh, not too sharp of a sword. Perhaps blunt can withstand it. But I don't recommend it because it's not uh, tested. So don't quote me on that, that it can actually save your life. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> and next one would be these items. Uh, these this are not tudung saji. But uh, <laughs> these, are, uh, these are shields. Shields of the Malay world with heavy influence from the Persians, the Turks, and also the Mughals. Perhaps you can share some insights on this one. Okay, in the Malay world, um, shields were often used uh, by uh, the infantry, and essentially our shields were were not or unlike the European uh, wooden shields. We had shields made of uh, rattan. You know, they, they weave the rattan into a circle, and then uh, they put a, a candle in the back. That was our shield. The advantage to having this kind of shield is that it was light and it floats. So it doesn't sink. Mm-hmm. So if you happen to drop it in the river, you can still, you know, can catch retrieve it. it. Yeah. Or you can, you can even swim with it. <laughs> um, there, there are some examples in uh, museums where these uh, so-called wicker shields have leather coverings on top. So um, I'm assuming that maybe these are uh, perhaps uh, palace guard shields. Mm. So they, they look more, they, they have the, the, the more... Um, more presentation. Uh, presentation, a more, more uh, presentable look compared <laughs> to the, the bare, wicker shields used by the common soldier. Mm. But um, the main advantage was that uh, Breton uh, was not easily... Especially when they're dry, mm. so it can withstand a lot of force. It absorbs a lot of impact. Uh, it's not easily broken. Mm. It can float. It's light, so it's it's actually a, a really um, and they have been used as late as I would say the 1980s mm. by our uh, FRU Federal Reserve Unit. Mm. If you remember back then, they had those big blue and red shields. Mm. They were actually the same thing that our, you know, our, our soldiers used 600 years ago, 500 years ago. Mm. It's much more easily mm-hmm. accessible compared to any kind of steel or metal. Yes, a, a steel, you know, a metal shield is very heavy mm. unless you make it small. So if it's small, then it becomes a buckler mm. and that will change your, uh, your fighting style. Mm. Um, these uh, kind of shields, I'm sure, could also stop arrows. Mm, because of the wicker construction. Yeah, the wicker was tight. It was tight, tightly woven, so it could stop arrows as well. Mm. As opposed to wooden or metal shields that, you know, sometimes uh, to, in order to make it light enough, the metal had to be thin. Mm. So when it's thin, it can be uh, penetrated by missile weapons. Mm. I think we, we don't see much of shields in the Malay market nowadays in Malaysia in terms of goods being traded. We often mm-hmm. see blades, kris, more so than shields, I would say. What do you think? Yes, um, as far as I know, um, there's only one or two traders uh, selling shields mm. uh, of the type. And uh, it's even harder to find the, the 
the leather covered shields or the, the, the ones with the brass studs, those are even harder to find. So uh, perhaps also due to the lack of, uh, shall I say, uh, forms of silat that use shields nowadays, mm. because many silat tend to focus on the parang and the kris, you know, they don't really, there's very few that use the shield. So there's uh, not much demand for it. But um, if I may suggest, this is something that we should uh, manufacture in large uh, quantities because it's it's actually a very useful thing. Mm. I mean, like you have home invasions and you have any issues. Yes. The main thing is to defend yourself and it's not an offensive yes. thing. Yes, it, it can be. <laughs> mm. But generally, if it I if I were to upload this on Facebook to sell, I won't get striked out because I because it looks like a weapon. To, I can sell it as a tudung saji, in, in, <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> All right. Uh, but ultimately, I want to highlight one thing, one item that has become basically our our heritage in terms of the Malays having uh, personnel protection, which is something that is used nowadays as a form of a busana or part of a busana, which is this. Maybe you can share with us about this particular item. Okay. This uh, particular item is called the pende, which is uh, practically the only part of the Malay armor that's left nowadays. And uh, it's, it's essentially a belt buckle. Um, I have one here if I may show you. Mm-hmm. So it's right there. And uh, it protects the uh, abdomen of sorts. Mm. Um, I've seen uh, 19th uh, century photographs showing very large pende in one in Sumatra. So that means they, they, they are actually effectively protecting the wearer. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's smaller. Okay, some are made slightly bigger. But these were... Um, shall we say the remnants of Malay armor and if you look at it nowadays it's not just armor it is also a symbol of uh, a status symbol so not just nowadays I mean like 200 years ago perhaps uh, people don't wear the pending all the time a few people uh, wear the pending those um, normally of uh, royalty or those of the courts, uh, the, the so-called pembesa, the, uh, the lords, mm. they wear the pendulum as a symbol of their status. Mm. And also would be and, a, uh, a wealth symbol as well, wouldn't it be? Yes, yes, because some of these are made from gold. Mm. So they're made of gold, they're made of silver. Uh, nowadays, they're commonly made of brass. But back then, they were silver and gold. And uh, I... There was a, a, a book by G.B. Gardner, uh, Malay Weapons. Mm. It's another Malay Weapons. Okay, there was a picture in there of half of a belt, a padded belt, with a pending attached. Mm. So that means it was worn with armor. Mm. Like, much like what I'm wearing now. So, uh, uh, the pending was actually part of the, the whole suit. Mm. Um, if uh, if I manage to find the, the photo, I will share it with you later. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, before we move on to the third and fourth segment, I would like to answer some questions from the audience. Uh, first of all, uh, from Shad Lishan, I don't get it. How can Malay use widely firearm than bow and arrow? What I understand, bow and arrow is first generation long range weapon. Uh, so with that, I would say um, it's the necessity of the invention itself. If you have something superior, you wouldn't be relying on something that is uh, less superior. At least that's my opinion. What do you think, Pakunara? Uh, yes. Uh... Tactically, you should go for the more superior weapon. But then again, strategically, if the superior weapon does not uh, does not uh, answer your needs, 
Okay, for example, like uh, I said before, during a commando raid, uh, guerrilla warfare, firearms would have been uh, not as effective because, first of all, they were loud. Mm. And secondly, the, the flash would definitely give your position away. And thirdly, if you were to crawl on the ground and, and uh, perhaps go into rivers and such, the firearm will not be able to fire. Mm. Because of, of the wet powder. So they had certain weaknesses there that uh, made the firearm less favorable to the uh, bow and arrows. Mm. So in certain conditions, perhaps the, the bow, bow and arrows were, were you know, put forward. They were the main, uh, the preferred weapon. But when defending a fortress, for example, or defending a ship, you need further, you need longer range on, on your projectile weapons. And that is where the firearms come into play. And uh, like uh, we've discussed before, when you're on an elephant, for example, uh, that would be the best uh, place for you to deploy the musket. Mm. Well, you're, you're yeah. practically on a walking fort. Mm. So you're basically uh, protected from from the enemy, and you have all the time you need to reload while your elephant uh, goes around stomping on the enemy. Mm. So in that sense, right? Or what it it really defines is the elephant is as a mobile fortress. At the same time, the 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 mahouts or the people who control the elephants and the riders at the back have an array of missile weapons at their disposal. So it could be bow and yeah. arrows, javelins, guns, anything that they can throw down to their enemies. Even rocks could even be mid- put into the mix. Yes. Mm. I mean, if it came down to it, it could have even had rocks up there, you know? Mm. Uh, if you run out of it, of, yeah. of, uh, I mean, of course, rocks would be useful. Mm. <laughs> so uh, for, for that, just now from Shad Lishan, uh, in regards to uh, the bow and arrow is the prime first generation long range weapon. I would rebut that and say rocks are the first generation of range weapons, <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps maybe even spears, which predates the bow and arrow. Mm, yes. Mm-mm-mm. Okay. Uh, a few more questions before we move on to the next uh, thing, sir. Beside arms, archery, armor, and artillery w- were being used in the battle. What about fortress and defensive wall in the Malay Wars by Muhammad Benjamin? That would definitely call for another session. Okay, hope that answers your question, Muhammad Benjamin. And two more. It's not, <laughs> Sorry? it's not a simple thing to answer. It's not, it's not, it does not come with a simple answer because uh, we're talking about fortresses and uh, walls and cities. That, that is a totally different uh, context from what we are uh, discussing tonight, mm. like just like the one uh, about naval warfare, so that's entirely that's a different book mm. altogether. So, uh, from Muhammad Benjamin as well, he have requested Tuan Nara. Could you list down the reference books or suggested books to read? Uh, what I can uh, suggest you, Muhammad Benjamin, uh, uh, try to, try to follow uh, Tuan Nara on Facebook, and he will basically have resources of what he mentions or what he talks about. So follow follow his page and follow his Facebook, his Instagram. You will get a lot of these references. But perhaps after this video, uh, Pak Kunara can have a short list of the suggested readings that you can p- probably share on your page. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll share some on the page. Mm, so Muhammad uh, Benjamin also quoted, In the blockade of Kedah in 1838, a midshipman's exploit Malayan water, written by Captain Sherard Osborne. In this book, writer do tell about Malay boats. So at least now we have one academic resource for, for the 18th century, which could be yeah. uh, towards the... Uh, it's still in the golden age of sailing. Mm-hmm. So maybe again, uh, maybe we can take a look at that book. I'm sure there is a PDF somewhere in Google Scholar. And uh, other than that, that is the last of the comments. So let's continue on this one slightly. Here I have is a, a relief of uh, a depiction of the legendary Hang Tua. And o- over here, I have two questions in related to this from Ejan Narizan. Uh, Assalamualaikum Tuan Nara. I'll translate it for you. It's in Malay. I have two questions. Uh, first of it, we know Hang Tua is an expert in close quarter combat. Uh, is there any information that suggests that Hang Tua 
carries other weapons such as the Krumbit or the Thrakul. Number two, I have seen what is uh, illustrated on old maps. What was written now as the, as the South China Sea is actually the Malay Sea. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So perhaps you can uh, respond to that. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, as, uh, as far as other types of weapons are concerned, <clears throat> there was uh, an account by the Japanese I'm not sure if uh, they were referring directly to Hang Tuah because they mentioned the uh, Mana, but obviously during that time it was him. Um, it was said that he had five to seven blades on his body. So it, it is customary by Japanese before you enter the palace, you have to disarm yourself yeah, yeah. and you can only hold on to just one weapon. So Probably he only held on to his uh, his kris, whereas the other weapons, uh, his sundang or the kris panjang, he could have had a spear. Uh, firearms, I'm not too sure because I have not really come across any references saying that um, Hantua used firearms, use any guns. But if they are, we please share. That would be interesting to know. Mm. Um, the Karambit would definitely be there as well because uh, if uh, if uh, any of you had followed my previous uh, postings on, on Facebook, there was this uh, photo of me with uh, multiple weapons. So uh, even in, in, uh, in my tradition, in my school, one warrior would carry more than one weapon, definitely. Okay, because you have a, a ranged weapon. Okay, for example, bow and arrow or a spear. And then you will have a medium range weapon, a sword, for example, um, or a short spear that you want to have behind me. Mm. And then you have a closer, close range weapon, which is uh, normally a parang or a sunda. Not unlike this one here. Okay, this is a shorter range compared to the sword. And then um, there would be, of course, the body, the tumbuh ladder, all sorts of these short blades, including the karambit. Um, and lastly, the kris. Because uh, to me, the kris is actually not a weapon per se. It is more of a, um, a symbol of the man's honor. Mm, it's an identity. Gentleman's uh, a sign of a gentleman. See? Mm. So when you have the grace on your belt, that means you are a gentleman. So you are expected to act accordingly. It means when you have the grace there, you cannot just go and hoo ha all around. You know, you have to have a certain um, etiquette when wearing the grace. So, in my opinion, in, uh, in the Japanese standards, Hang Tuah would have had his grace by his side. It's just like the samurai would be allowed to carry the wakizashi or the tanto, but he needs to leave the katana at the door. Mm. So, um, basically, that's about half a dozen type of weapons other than firearms, which I do not have any reference to. Mm. So yes, uh, Hang Tuah did carry a lot of weapons. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And in terms of the second part of the question on the uh, South China Sea, if I'm not mistaken, it's called the Sunda Sea? South China Sea, uh, Sunda Sea is a more recent uh, name for it. Okay. Um, there was a map by the British, actually. Mm. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was either late 19th or early 20th century, mm -hmm. saying that it mm -hmm. is called the Malay Sea. Mm. And then after the war, they changed it to South China Sea. Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect that there is a, a political movement there. Mm. Um, I, I would not comment on that because we're going to go into a different angle when we talk about that. Mm. But the fact was, uh, I, I did see a map 
date that either early in the 20th century or late in the 20th century, saying that the South China Sea was indeed the Malay Sea. Mm, excuse me for my camera because I'm just uh, switching the charging port because I'm also running out of battery because it's been a very in interesting discussion. <laughs> so just give me one second. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Mm, so in terms of the epitomology of the name of the sea, I think it's best we will not touch on that matter because it will be much more politically oriented and I don't think uh, this discussion is supposed to be a political discussion. So Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. And um, uh, I think that covers uh, our questioning and perhaps uh, before we move on to the next segment, uh, perhaps you can share in brief the two distinctive types of uh, styles or fighting styles that that we uh, that the Malays currently practice. Okay, uh, we're talking about fighting styles. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about you know the, the present uh, teaching of of silat, but when I was learning silat, okay, we were exposed to two types of uh, fighting styles known as the uh, permainan laksmana and the permainan hulu balak. Mm. Okay. Uh, laksmana is, uh, some would say admiral, but I think a more accurate description of laksmana would be a uh, general. Because he was not just in charge of the Navy, he was practically in charge of the entire army. Mm. So actually, laksmana is, is a commander. Okay, Lasmana is commander, Hulu Balang is warrior. But in the Malay sense, this does not mean that the Lasmana is superior to the, uh, the Hulu Balang. Mm. Okay, it does not mean that the general is superior to the warrior. Because uh, when talking about fighting styles, okay, there are two, two distinct uh, fighting styles in uh, Silat, Silat Melayu. One is where you have a higher stance of almost erect or slightly uh, lowered stance mm -hmm. and you do not uh, jump around, you do not roll around, you, do, you use minimal uh, movements and, and this is what's commonly referred to as uh, the permainan laksmana. Okay. Uh, the other one is permainan hulu balang or the, the warrior's uh, play, so to say. Pemainan Hulu Balang is the opposite of Pemainan Laksmana. Pemainan Hulu Balang is a style where you have middle to low stance and uh, you tend to roll around, you tend to jump around a lot, um, you tend to grapple. Okay, it's more of a physical type of, of fighting compared mm. to the uh, Pemainan Laksmana. So I'm not saying that the permainan laksmana is uh, superior to permainan hulu balang or the permainan hulu balang is superior to permainan laksmana. Each have their own distinct uh, advantages and uh, each uh, style is applied um, in... A specific purpose perhaps? A specific purpose is a specific uh, situation. So for example, if you are fighting uh, on a ship um, or, or in a building, for example, a place where you cannot simply just jump out of the way, mm. okay, or a place that you simply cannot run away or you cannot roll around, is a very a small passageway perhaps, mm. the permainan laksmana is the best. Mm. You, have to do, you have to use that. But if you're in open warfare, you're... You're on the field. You know, it's, it's an open warfare. So, Pemaina Laksmana may not uh, be the most ideal style for you to practice uh, in that situation. Mm. So, that is where the Pemaina Nubalang comes in. And uh, the warriors of old, they know both styles, not just one. Mm. So, they are adapted to both styles. And uh, I would like to add uh, another point on the Pemaina Laksmana. It is also suitable for those wearing armor. Mm. So, I mean, uh, 
like yourself, you're, you're familiar with Alma, you know how it restricts somewhat our movement. Mm. Uh, you cannot just simply run around and roll around, jump around in armor. Mm. Yep. Of, Your movement is more economical, I would say. You have more economies yeah. of movement. Yes. And, and first of all, the, the weight of the armor itself will, will tire you down, will, will pull you down. Mm. And then um, the restrictions on, on the pieces of armor will uh, definitely restrict your movement somewhat. So that is why the Pemainan Laksmana was uh, introduced. Mm. For one of the reasons could have been because of people wearing armor. Okay, So uh, those wearing armor would have been, uh, would have been uh, more suited for Pemainan Laksmana. Those without armor would have been more suited for Pemainan Laksmana. But looking at Malay armor, it does not mean that you know if you wear Malay armor, you cannot use uh, or utilize permainan guna bala. Mm. So that's the advantage of uh, Malay armor. It's not overly heavy uh, as to restrict totally restrict your movements. You can still move, but to a certain degree. So um, in a way, it's actually a, a give and take uh, between protection and uh, mobility. So when you talk about Malay, okay. So I hope that answers the uh, question on permainan laksmana and permainan uh, banang. Mm. Okay, I think uh, that would be a very good, uh, very brief that you are you are actually sharing that. But uh, it's okay because if we go into even slightly more detail, again, it will be too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this comes down, it boils down, we've talked about the Malay world, we've talked about the equipments, we've also talked about the types of influences that could have possibly influenced the region. And now I would like to get to the heart of the discussion today, which is the Janawi Sukma. So uh, Pak Kunara, perhaps you can enlighten us on these three uh, rather distinct looking blades. Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, the Janawi is a long-bladed, two-handed sword. Okay, uh, if you look at the pictures there, we have three uh, swords. Um, the one with the blue background is, if I'm not mistaken, that is the Chura Sinunga yeah. mm-hmm. The sword belonging to the Sultan of Perak. Supposedly handed down from the Sultan of Malacca, who got it from his ancestor, um, Sang Sapurba. So this sort, if this is the original sort, uh, is about a thousand years old. Mm, that's very long. Yeah. Mm-mm-mm. So um, and then we have um, below it what looks like a katana, but is actually not a katana. That was a uh, it is a Jinawi, but this this example was uh, made in, in, in Thailand or Siam, Patani, perhaps it's Patani actually. Mm. And uh, it's currently in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the Smithsonian. Mm. So, an example of a, a, a Jinawi made in the north, northern state of uh, Patani. And then the one on the right, black background, is a Janawi made in Kuala Kangsa. Mm. It's a distinct style. Okay, the, the Kuala Kangsa Janawi has a distinct style. That was made in, in Kuala Kangsa is a more recent example. This one would be about, um, I would say, maybe 30 or 40 years old. Mm, um, very young. Yeah, it's very young compared to the other two. Mm. <laughs> but these are two different types of Janawi. And uh, over here, I have another one. Ah, okay. Okay. Mm. This one is the sort that you saw in the diagram earlier. Mm, okay. Yep, yep. So this is a, uh, this Jinawi came from Rambau, from Negeri Sembilan. Ah, okay. The sword, the blade is uh, similar to the one in the lower left picture. I see. The one that looks very closely like a katana. Yes. The okay. blade and the gun looks uh, similar to that. Mm. Um, uh, the hilt is rounded. It's uh, currently covered in uh, 
in, in string, in rope. Is that hemp or jute? Uh, hmm? Is that hemp or jute, the rope? I think it's jute. Mm, okay. Jute me. Yeah. Mm. So this is an example. This one is about uh, 100 to 180 years old. Mm. So this one is in between uh, the, the younger Jinawi and the older one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then uh, I... I uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Continue. Okay. And I, I, I do understand that you have an affinity on blacksmithing, on armor making. And here I have a picture of you in traditional armorers workshop, Kain Pelikat and Tanja. <laughs> Perhaps you can give some insight on what's happening here actually. Okay. This is uh, not entirely traditional. I'm, uh, uh, I'm using uh, an angle grinder there actually to speed up the process. Mm. Um, okay, what I was doing here, I was actually uh, uh, putting in the blade profile. So, um, if you look at the blade here, uh, the back of the blade is thicker than the front. Mm -hmm. Because this part is sharp and this part is dull. So, in order to achieve that, there are two ways of doing it. Either you hammer it out mm -hmm. or you can grind it out. So what I'm doing there in that picture there is actually to grind out this uh, the bevel, the mm. each bevel here. So that was, uh, that's what I'm doing. So you're just removing material to create the bevel. Yep. I see. Okay. And ultimately, um, after some uh, after your research and basically your own exploration and findings, and you have developed this particular one. Yes. Maybe she yeah, can. Mm, very interesting design and concept. Perhaps you'd like to enlighten uh, me and everyone here about the Janawi Sukma. Okay, Janawi Sukma. I have here another example. Okay. This sword is not historical. Okay, first and foremost, we have to understand that this is not a historical sword. So please don't ask me uh, where did you get this. Uh, you know, historical example of this or where did you, which museum did you find it in? No, mm. but this is not historical. First and foremost, I designed this. Mm. It was based on, based on this. Okay, this was the actual Janawi. Mm. My ancestors would have used this. But, uh, looking at the way uh, the the art has evolved mm. and looking at uh, certain uh, certain uh, necessities so I came up with this design mm. essentially I removed the guard okay I have it there I removed the guard because uh, in order for us to hold the blade in mm. in the reverse so with a the guard there, that would have been uh, difficult to do. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. I see. And then, um, the other feature of the Janami Supa is this part here that we call the Gandhi. Mm. Gandhi and this, uh, this uh, what we call the Dagu or the, <clears throat> the chin here. Mm -hmm. So this part is entirely uh, blunt. It's dull. Mm. Okay. The function of this part is either to uh, for you to, to counter or parry an attack or you can also hold it there in a half sorting maneuver. Mm. This, is, uh, this effectively shortens the blade from uh, 26 inches to about 18. Mm. So effectively so, what you have done, you have taken the, the essence of the Janawi and applied a tactical approach to it, essentially. Yes. Mm, okay, uh, please continue on your sharing. Okay, uh, so if you look at this, uh, the hilt is slightly different. Mm. We have this uh, pointed design here called the tapak hijam, mm. or the, the near hoof, mm. hijam, which is also a weapon, incidentally. Uh, this uh, sharp end here can easily be used to knock out an opponent. Mm, it's a bludgeoning end. It's a bludgeoning end. So, um, you can also uh, use it to 
hammer somebody mm. okay um there's a small area here, a small recess here mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you can see there yeah that yeah. is called the uh, lehe or the neck this actually should stop incoming blades if it slides down the blade mm so when blades sliding down it will stop there that's why this does not have a guard So uh, the other the other part where the blade where the uh, opponent's blade will be stopped will be here the dagu. Mm. So we have it there. So if a blade happens to slide down, it will be stopped here. Mm. But um, as you may know, in uh, in Suma Kejana, we do not uh, clash blades. So these uh, these features are basically safety features. Should we clash blades but if uh, we don't then uh, this uh, janawi supma will function as a janawi is supposed to, mm. to so i understand you you use this particular design exclusively in nara martial arts yes i see i It's, see uh, it is a, an exclusive design and uh, i can say that no one else uses this type, this type of sword because mainly i designed it i made it so um, if uh, you happen to find any other examples out there that are not mine and then, uh, that means they are basically uh, bootleg versions of the jinawi supa mm. and, uh, and and to to add further we have uh, Pattern pending on this. Ah, nice. That so, that pattern is for Malaysia market or global? Ah, uh, it's for global. Ah, great, great. It's because we we hardly see many Malaysian pa- uh, patterns going global, so perhaps this is one of the few traditional inspired items that is going for patenting. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be very, very uh, interesting to see once it has been approved for the pa- patent. So currently, the Janawi Sukma uh, sword itself, the blade, is patent pe- pending. Yes. I see. That is actually very, very interesting. And this is basically, you're, you're, you're using the term Janawi uh, based on Kamus Dewan Edisi 1970. The, yes. The, the terminology of Janawi, which is, mm-hmm. perhaps you can share a bit on the Kamus Dewan's definition. Okay, the Kamus Dewan's uh, definition of Janawi is a long-bladed weapon, a long-bladed sword with a, a long handle that can accommodate two hands. Mm, so, so it's a two-handed uh, sword. It's a two-handed sword. Mm. So uh, based on the Kamus Dewan, it means that the Janawi is a two-handed long-bladed sword. So if uh, If, uh, for example, we have this, this is a long bladed sword, but it is a single handed uh-huh. uh, grip. So you cannot call this a Janawi. Mm. That is a very distinct uh, style of sword. And uh, in a, in a later uh, interpretation, I think uh, Uh, in the 90s or early 2000 edition of the Kamus Dewan, mm-hmm. it mentions specifically uh, like a Japanese sword. So, uh, obviously, this looks like a Japanese sword. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is a Janawi according to uh, Dewan Pasa. Mm. And uh, as uh, Dewan Pasa is the authority on Bahasa Melayu, so we accept the uh, terminology, the, the uh, explanation for it, mm. the definition for it. Mm-mm-mm. So at least if anyone is wondering whether this 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 name, Janawi Sukma, is just a, a fairy tale invention of Pak Kunara, uh, no, you can actually look into Kamus Dewan. It is an authorized uh, literature on the Malay language and the definition fits exactly the kind of blade that Pak Kunara was demonstrating just now. So I hope that clarifies any misconception. This is based on academic reference. It's not just, I think this is a Janawi. No, it's an academic reference for for all of you who are wondering. 
But most importantly, I would I would like to ask um there's a Seni Padang Sukma Kenchana. Currently you are con you are still conducting your lessons, but you have taken everything online now. Perhaps you can share a little bit on that. Okay. Uh, due to the current conditions, the uh, pandemic, uh, we have uh, halted our physical classes. Uh, so now we are totally online. So how we do it is that uh, on a weekly basis, uh, we will issue uh, exercises or challenges to the students. Okay, you have to do this for this week. And they will send in their videos uh, doing what we requested them to do. So based on that, I will uh, evaluate our, our team, our uh, we call Dewan Perguruan. Uh, we have a team of uh, instructors. Okay, we will evaluate and uh, we will improve on the students' uh, performance based on the videos that they send in to us. Mm. Uh, once in a while, we also do live uh, classes because uh, it's sometimes not easy to get everybody in. Mm -hmm. But once uh, we can get that, uh, we come up with a webinar uh, internally. But uh, perhaps uh, in in the coming uh, coming months, uh, we will have uh, we will make available the webinars to all mm. students so uh, because we want everybody to know about uh, Sukma Kencana mm. so the name Jenari Sukma comes from Sukma Kencana Sukma Kencana is the art of uh, is our art of uh, of the sword mm. so to define the Jenari, the Jenari Sukma and uh, the traditional Jenari we call it Jenari Sukma mm. so there is an, uh, uh, its own classification Basically, this is your interpretation of the classical weapon. Yes. Mm -mm. So let, let's get all and, that very clear. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and then uh, back to the online classes, there will also be uh, an English version for international uh, participants. Mm, very interesting. So, um, <clears throat> those of you who do not speak Malay, um, we are preparing a series of... Uh, the classes are uh, conducted through videos, instructional videos. So we will post up the videos. Those who subscribe to the classes, we will uh, give them access to these videos. Uh, they will need to watch the videos and then they will need to repeat what we uh, demonstrated the videos mm. uh, in their own video and then send it to us so that we can evaluate. So that's how we do it. Mm. Because for, um, from our experience, it's, it's very hard to get everybody uh, together in one uh, specific time, especially when you're going international. So it's morning here, it could be night somewhere else, it could be uh, middle of the day somewhere else. Mm. So we use the video approach. So they can view the video at any time and they can send their feedback to us at any time. So we take away the time factor there. Mm. But in, in that sense, wouldn't that, uh, wouldn't that risk the students not sending the video at all? For example, like me. <laughs> well, you guys are paying for it. So if you don't send the video, it's your loss. Your loss. <laughs> uh, but I will get back to that video on you. Uh, don't worry about it. So I, I will get there one day. <laughs> One fine day. Yeah, all right. So on the uh the uh, Sukma Kenchana Academy, uh, if you want to know more information about this, uh, they are available on Facebook and on Instagram. And but as Pak Kunara has mentioned earlier, everything is in a repository of a subscription basis where the content is there, and basically whatever you record will be evaluated by Pak Kunara and his team of experts and instructors to make sure that you are emulating the right steps and the right movement. Because from what I understand, every step has a meaning and every meaning has a reason. So if you would like to know more about the Janawi Sukma, feel free to directly contact Janawi Sukma or Pak Kunara on Facebook or Instagram. So I hope you people don't bother me asking about the classes because that's that's not me. That is Pak Kunara over there. 
All right. Okay, Pakunara, I think we are in the last segment already. The time now is 11.15. We, we only have about 15 minutes to go over this very popular topic in recent times, which is physical versus spiritual armor. So as we have, as we have uh, talked earlier, uh, I'm just here showcasing the different types of armor within the region of the Malaccan contemporaries. So these are elements that is available in the world at that time. First, you have here is a Mahout uh, armor, basically the elephant rider. If you notice, even his facial mask looks like an elephant. So, <laughs> so this is more on the Mamluks and the Persians. And over here, we have from the Qing. This is called the mountain armor with multiple layers of lamella. And here you have the mirror armor. Again, famously in the, in the Turkish, Persian, and Mughals. And of course, you have the Japanese suit of armor, similar to what I'm wearing today. So these types of armor all have similar traits. In a sense, they all have a form of chain mail. They all have a form of plates. They all protect the same regions of the body. So this tells us a lot about the practicality. However, as I've noticed... Uh, people in Malaysia, they fail to realize how an armor works. It's not just one piece of item that you are impervious to any kind of attacks. So here I show a very simple layering technique that is commonly used in the West. Perhaps Pak Kunara can give some insights on this. Okay, uh, when we talk about armor, it is not just the sharp weapons that we need to think about. Okay, uh, when you hit somebody, you say, with a sword, okay, let's just uh, take this, for example, the sword here. So when you hit somebody with a sword, it's not just the edge that cuts into your flesh. There is also the force of the entire blade coming in at you. This is about uh, 600 grams. So when you swing this, the force of the blade... Uh, goes together with the, the sharp edge. Mm. So if you were only to wear one layer of armor, for example, just one layer of chain mail, you might not get cut, but the force will definitely break the bones underneath. Mm. So if you look at the slide here, um, this is a very basic uh, setup where you have three layers, at least at minimum, three layers of armor. The first layer is a, what we call a gambeson. Mm -hmm. is, a, is basically a padded jacket. Okay, this one is uh, is uh, to, to absorb the force, like I said, for the force of the sword coming in. So the gambeson absorbs the shock. Mm. Okay, the next layer is the chain mail. The chain mail prevents the sword from going, going into your uh, flesh. Mm -hmm. So we have here protection against uh, blood force trauma and uh, protection against an edge weapon. Mm. But what happens if somebody hits you with a club or with a war hammer? Mm. That would definitely not. Uh, you know, the chain mail definitely cannot withstand that. It will. It will give, and the gambeson would not be thick enough to absorb the war hammer's uh, force. So. In order to uh, prevent the warhammer from uh, damaging you, you have another layer of plates, solid mm. steel or metal or whatever other materials that you have, uh, plates to basically absorb the first impact of the uh, percussion weapon. And uh, the gambeson underneath absorbs the rest of the shock. So this is how armor works, layering. And uh, with these solid plates, the, the, the main weakness of these plates, as opposed to the chain mail, the chain mail goes, wraps around your body. It's, it's like a fabric. Mm. So um, it, is, uh, it is very flexible. Whereas the plates are not, they are solid. So they're bound to be gaps here and there. That is why if you look at this uh, slide, you have chain mail underneath the plates. Mm. And underneath the chain mail, you have the gambeson. So they, they, these three, they work in unison. They cannot work independently of each other. 
Mm. So you need to have all three elements in order to have uh, an effective uh, form of armor. Mm-mm-mm. So basically, that's it. So the layering techniques even works in modern armor. For example, the flag jackets or the bulletproof armor, where you have a layer of Kevlar in front, you have the steel plate inside, and of course, in the inside, you still have your EVA paddings. So there are multiple layers. But the distinction I would like to make here is that modern armor is used to stop bullets, not arrows, yes. not blades, or anything else like that. And for that yes. purpose, we won't be discussing in detail. It's a different topic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And here are the types of armor that's more commonly associated with the Islamic crescent. You have the standard chainmail, and then the plate with chainmail, and then we have the lamella, which is also popular in, in, in Asian cultures and the, the nomadic steppes cultures. So these are just as a snapshot. Again, tonight is a discussion, it's not a lecture. And these is, are also a few more popular types of armor that could have been used here as well. This is the char aina or the four plates armor which is essentially trays of metal that is uh, fastened together similar to a modern body armor, similar to a Japanese style armor. So that tells us the function is still the same, which is for defense and personal defense, and the areas remains the same. That also tells us the kind of war tactics or fighting styles that requires this particular set of protection. Perhaps, Pak Kunara, you can explain a bit. Armor, it does not make you invincible, but it makes you less likely to die or prolong your time in the battlefield. Perhaps you can add um, on, yes. a bit on this? Yes, uh, there is a, a general misconception on armor. So, uh, people tend to think that, oh, I got armor on, so I'm not going to die. No. <clears throat> Wearing armor does not make you a tank. Even tanks can be uh, disabled. So, armor actually helps you to survive longer in the battlefield. And uh, the main, main function of the armor is not to stop an oncoming attack. It is more to deflect it. Okay, so some people call it uh, parry an attack. It is not to parry an attack, it is more to deflect an attack. So, uh, uh, in a way, it helps you to not get injured. Okay, that, that is the purpose of armor. It's not, it's not that uh, when you put on a sort of armor, you become impervious to all weapons. Not necessarily. Okay, there are anti-armor weapons. That's why they were invented. But, uh, at least by having armor on you, uh, you would last a bit longer on the battlefield and you can do more damage to the enemy and you can hopefully also return home with uh, less injuries than your your compatriots who did not wear armor mm. so basically that's that's the function of armor uh, there so is a wouldn't... there is a notion from western literatures if there is a knight in armor the op the opposing force will not kill the person instead they will try to capture them for ransom <laughs> okay, uh, it may have been true because normally knights in armor are the rich guys. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, okay, um, the armor of King Henry the Eighth. Uh, he was about time of Malacca thereabouts. His full suit of armor would today cost you. Two hundred and fifty thousand ringgit. Two hundred fifty thousand ringgit. Yep. That, are you sure that's not a GDP of a, a GDP of a small country? <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. So this suit of armor is worth a small country at the time. So, uh, yep, at that time. So that is why people wearing armor were usually captured and then held for ransom because they know these guys are rich. Mm. Only the books were armor, which is a similar case in in the, our world, you know, in in the Malay world. Only the rich can can afford to wear armor, and uh, that is why also not many people are wearing them. Mm. So in the West, uh, normally people who wear armor were either uh, lords or kings, aristocrats. Yeah, aristocrats, definitely rich people. 
So it is better. It's hard to kill them. That's one thing for sure. Might as well hold them for ransom, and then uh, you know bargain take essentially. Of them. <laughs> mm, they can also be a bargaining chip that could turn the tide yes. of a battle. Yep, definitely. Mm-mm-mm. So these are the few things maybe that um, we don't really uh, pay too much mind into. It's something of a passing thing, but I think the concept of ransom and holding a, a, a valuable prisoner to change as a strategy of battle could also be some of the tactics that is used here as well. I mean, it applies everywhere because it's just human nature to see something of value holding it against the other person. So I think this could also be part of the war tactics and formation, so to speak. It's a kind of strategies of gambits to be used as long as you win over your enemy. Yep, it was definitely used uh, even here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if you look into the manuscripts, into the Ikaya, uh, there will be many accounts of... Adoption and kidnapping. kidnapping. Yes, adoption <laughs> and kidnapping is common. Mm. Even uh, uh, somebody mentioned about the uh, Perang Kedah Siam, the Perang Musuh Misi just now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the king, the, the Sultan of Kedah was uh, basically captured by the Siamese mm. and he was held uh, for ransom for a while. So that means that the tactic is is actually is, is universal. Everybody does it. Mm. And it could be possibly um, the, the 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 person of interest that was in captivity was wearing armor probably, so that the, the Siamese can see ah that's the one. <laughs> so there could be some kind of regalia that highlights the royalty on the battlefield, which make them possibly easy pickings, perhaps. It could also be yeah. Mm-mm-mm-mm. It's possible. All right. So next, I would like to show a very interesting article here which is talismanic shirt from the ottoman uh, sources uh, here we have their under undergarment before they put on their version of gambeson and chainmail and it seems to have a lot of geometric and calligraphic features maybe you can give some uh, insights on this particular uh, uh, garment okay uh... This is uh, where you know the the spiritual element comes in. You see, when you, when you go to war, it is not just a physical thing. War involves uh, the, the supernatural or the spiritual as well. So when you go to war, your enemies are not just the physical enemies that you see. Uh, back then, even now. Your enemies would use uh, paranormal or supernatural tactics as well. You see, so these uh, talismanic shirts were an effort to defend against those types of attacks. And uh, if you look at the designs, the geometric designs, the uh, the color that they use, okay, all of this they emit a sort of uh, frequency. Okay. So this this frequency or aura, as I would say, is a is a sort of a shield in itself, an unseen shield. So if uh, the enemy were to attack using uh, magic, so to say, this will protect them against the enemy uh, attack. Mm. So uh, yeah, th- this was actually a part of an, an important part of of the armor actually. Mm-mm-mm-mm. And in, in this sense, uh, with all these inscriptions, uh, this is an effort. I would put here is an effort to mm-hmm. avoid the, the, the supernatural in this sense. But that does not mean that the wearer is going is against the Islamic religion, does it? No, no, no. It, it is like, you know, when, when you fall sick, you take a, a couple of uh, paracetamol tablets. Mm. So, who, who cures you? It's not the paracetamol that cures you, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who comes from God? So, the, the same concept applies here. The shirt does not protect you. It's actually the, the, what are written there are basically prayers. Mm. So, when you wear these uh, kind of shirts, you do not depend on the shirts, but you depend on God. This is sort of your, uh, your effort to protect yourself against the unseen. 
Mm. And uh, another thing is that these symbols, uh, they mean something to the unseen. Okay, for example, uh, it's like, um, shall we say, our traffic signboards, you know, okay. no entry, slow down, stop. So it is a, it is sort of a traffic sign for the unseen. Mm. Uh, and geometric shapes. Like you don't want to come this way. Yeah. So it's to like, speak. Do not attack this person. You know, it can, it's can, it kind of give that message to the, the unseen. Mm-mm-mm-mm. I see. Okay. Um, however, uh, okay, I'll just uh, update some of the sharings on the chat. Probably you can't see it there because we are in the Google Meet uh, room. Um, uh -huh. About Malay Boats and Sailing, there is a book written by G.A. Henty in his Malay Pirates Story of Dangerous uh, Voyage. So that's another book that is quite interesting. So it's right there. Mr. Muhammad Benjamin have... Uh, graciously left us some uh, citations here that we can look into for further discussion. Uh, Shat Lishan again mentions here, it it's really exists those ancient times they are using supernatural in battlefield. Wow, I'm impressed. Yes, they've been doing it even before the dawn of time. So perhaps Pak Kudara yeah. can enlighten a bit. Okay, uh, supernatural elements have been around since you know, the first man uh came down on earth you know, ever since uh prophet adam uh, was uh, cast to earth it has been used since then okay, it's been used in time memorial every culture used it to a certain extent some maybe more than others so uh we can see that for example uh, the Eastern cultures have their set of uh, shamans and whatnot. Yeah. And, whatnot. and we have Merlin the, uh, in the West. Yeah? We have Merlin in the West. Yes, we have Merlin in the West. We have the African shamans. We have uh, even the North American. Uh, the Indian tribes. The people, Indian yeah. tribes. You know, everybody at one point or another had resorted to these. Uh, supernatural or spiritual uh, tactics mm. even the Malays and the Malays especially are known to be very uh, close <laughs> to this uh, unseen world you mm. know so it, uh, so yeah. yeah go ahead so uh, it is actually not not something uh, that is strange to us to our ancestors it's, it's, to them it's uh, it's like a game Mm. Okay, to them, but to us nowadays, it's, it's something serious, something major. Mm. Because we are no longer of that time, we are no longer of that um, uh, situation. So we, we don't really, we are not really familiar with the unseen as they were. Mm. They are more so, in tune with that kind of practices back then. Yes, yes, definitely. Mm, 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 mm. And um, what is interesting, uh, based on this concept, uh, as we have clarified, it's not exclusive to the Malay or the Islamic faith. It is everywhere. It uh, exists in all known cultures and histories. But one thing that I would like to point out in this kind of time where it is mass-produced, the ah. talismanic shirt is then mass-produced. And this is one uh, particular example of a mass-produced version. So maybe you can give some insights on this particular one. Okay. Um, you see, the original talismanic shirts, they were handmade and handwritten by people who knew what they were doing. So the people who made the shirt, the who wrote the inscriptions, they knew what they were doing. They, they knew exactly what they were doing. So, uh, there is a, a personal touch to it. You know, the, the, the persons, the, the artists or the, uh, the, the shaman or whatever you wish to call him, he has intent uh, when he was, you know, doing these uh, images, these uh, scripts. There's intent there. There is a form of prayer there. There is what we call doa there. 
whereas uh, when you look at these uh, current, uh, the, the later versions, uh, those that are printed out, mass produced, uh, there, there's no soul there. You know, it's just like any other kind of printed cloth. Mm. So, in in that sense, um, this this new version does not have the significance of the original ones. So, uh, I, in a way, it will affect the effectiveness of uh, this uh, uh, type of uh, armor. Mm, 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 mm. Because I, I do see this being sold on Shopee. It's so easy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it used, to, it used to be, it is very hard, actually. It's not an easy task to come up with all of these. But nowadays, you can just, uh, with a few clicks, uh, it'll be sent to you. Yeah, within one week, free shipping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for those, uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's uh, let's say, uh, I think uh, a good... Uh, a good uh, parallel would be this. <clears throat> Wearing actual steel armor, okay, mm -hmm. versus a cheap uh, plastic ring chainmail. PVC pipes. So, yeah, PVC pipes, maybe. They look practically the same. Basically, they look the same. Mm. But the steel rings will protect you, whereas the PVC... Well, make you look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> look stupid, it might not even you know. It, it will definitely not save you from a, uh, a sword strike. Let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. You you will die looking stupid. Ah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the concept here is is similar. You know, the actual thing may have caused a bomb to make. And uh, probably nobody knows how to make them anymore. And the uh, the newer version, as you said, can can be just ordered online and get so you can just wear it. But how significant is it? How effective is it as opposed to the original article? Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, these shirts are not just worn uh, as you know normal shirts. Uh, you know, you just go to a shop, buy it, and wear it. No, these shirts they have a certain, um, shall we say, uh, rituals and uh, certain incantations, and uh, some of them, or, or actually all of them, need to be handed down to the person by the uh, original person who made it. Mm. So you have to receive it from him and he will tell you the do's and don'ts of it mm. and you know, the whole process. Whereas mm. uh, the, the new ones, the mass produced ones, you do not have that. You just order it online, it comes and you just wear it. You don't know what is it for. Mm. So the pantang larang and everything, yeah. charitable yeah. but it's not that. The pantang larang is just as long as you it's pay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So actually, it needs to be what we call um, we we often call it ijazah. Mm. So, uh, so the, the the person who writes the uh, the, the, the the scriptures on the shirt will usually um, how do we say uh, ijazah the shirt to the person wearing it. Mm. to give permission, right? Or to certify it. Yeah, certify to certify. You you will certify the uh, the, the transmission to mm. the person wearing it. Mm. So in this sense, this element, uh, sorry, this element is lacking. This element is lacking when you order it online. Mm. Because the person making it is probably just with an AI or Photoshop file and click print. <laughs> probably, I mean, yes. or probably it can be probably. even more primitive. They just spray paint on a template. Yep, mm. most of it is like that. Mm. Most of the ones I've seen are just uh, screen printed. Mm. Like you can see here, there are some blotches from stamping. Yep. 
So, um, for for those of you who are who are thinking or considering buying the baju wafa on Shopee, um, uh, be clear on the purpose. Are you buying that just for decoration, or do you expect a protection? And clearly, we do not know how effective it is. Perhaps using modern technology, you can ask the wearer to demonstrate it and do a live video for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, it's technology. You know, what I mean, you can use technology yeah. to to that extent. Okay, perfect. So we have covered uh, all these topics in a very, in, in I would say, in a very short, short, short instances. And now we have come to the the time of Q and A. So for Q and A, I've actually collected some questions already, so that we don't waste time for people to come in and give us questions. So um, I'll I'll share with one uh here, uh. Uh, one question, during the Malaccan Sultanate, there were soldiers uh, sent by, uh, let me just try to translate it properly, because sometimes translating from Malay to English, I get stuck on the words. Okay. Uh, during the Malaccan Sultanate, uh, there were soldiers sent to, to aid Al-Fatih in conquering Constantinople. There were pictures mm -hmm. depicting soldiers wearing the tengkolo and the chainmail. So uh, that's first first part. Second, uh, second question. Uh, it was shared before by an ustaz on YouTube on a picture of the Al Fatih army with tengkolo. It was rumored that these were the army of Malacca. Where else in the world does anyone wear tengkolo? Does that mean? that the Malay warriors of the time that was sent there presumably wears chainmails and modern armour more reminiscent to those worn by the Turks. Okay. Um, I've seen uh, that, that uh, particular painting before. Mm. Um, um, and to my eye, the, the headgear does not actually look like a tengkolo. But then again, drawn by a Turkish artist, he might have been, you know, that might have been his interpretation of a tengkolo. Mm. Okay. That is one. So if it is not a tengkolo, that means that was uh, probably a Turkish uh, soldier in chainmail. Mm. But if it was, it just shows that the Malays also wore armour. Mm. See? Um, but uh, there were accounts that I mean that there has been uh, it has been recently revealed that uh, there was a connection between Malacca and the Ottoman uh, Sultanate mm -hmm. the, 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 the Sultans uh, frequently sent letters to each other yep, yep. so it is not impossible that you know, Malay warriors would have been there. And uh, there was even an account of uh, Hang Tuah going to uh, Istanbul or Constantinople at the time. Mm, it was called Room at the time, mm. right? Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. It was called Room at the time, yes. It was called Room at the time. Because Constantinople was uh, known as uh, the, the last uh, Roman Empire. Mm. So, uh, yes, if you say, uh, were the Malays involved, there is a high probability because of the painting. I, I wouldn't really say the painting is a, a, a really reliable source because it could have been painted hundreds of years later. Because mm. it could not, it, it may not have been contemporary. And another thing about paintings is that uh, it is up to the artist's interpretation. Mm. Mm -mm. And there, there could be a creative flair instead of actual yeah. documentation. Yes, yes. So, um, but uh, looking at other factors, there is a possibility that the, the beliefs were there. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite plausible that, you know, Mm. Malacca did send uh, reinforcements. Not to say reinforcement, maybe a few of uh, support the, in in, in a sense support. Yeah, the, in in defense, yeah. But there were some accounts that the, the the army defending Malacca during the Portuguese attack consists of soldiers 
from these countries on the flip side yes 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 Uh, and these accounts were made by the Portuguese, not the Malacans. Mm. Mm. So uh, the Portuguese observed that uh, there were about 20,000 soldiers in Malacca, 20 to 30,000, I think. Mm-hmm. And some of them uh, was quoted as wearing uh, chain mail. Mm. And uh, it is even said that they came from Rome, which, is, which was Turkey. So, uh, that means it was either uh, they were garrisoned there or they could have been trapped there. Of the, because it of the blockade? A, yeah, it could have been a, a political uh, envoy or something. Mm. And then uh, apparently the, the Portuguese attacked, so they were trapped there, they couldn't go anywhere. So, they fought along the, the black uh, soldiers. Or they could have been a garrison there itself. Mm. Uh, garrison of uh, Turkish uh, soldiers, like Uh, what they had in Aceh. Mm. I mean, in, 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 in that sense, a very in, in, uh, interesting to note, the flag of the Aceh, it has the Ottoman star and, and, and crescent moon. Mm-hmm. And even in the current map of Johor, it's essentially an Ottoman outpost in the middle of the Blue Sea. Yes. So that shows how close the people of the Malay were with the emergence and the imperialism of the Ottoman Empire. So, yep. it's not impossible that you would see a Malay uh, army or soldier wearing something exactly like yourself. Yes, it was, it was not. It was highly probable back then. And uh, it is not just uh, based on uh, flags and documents. Uh, my ancestor... Uh, nine generations above me was a Turk. Mm. He came from Turkey and uh, he landed in Aceh. Mm. So that is, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, I don't know, one tenth, one twentieth uh, Turkish, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So basically, you can trace back, even from yourself, you have a lineage or lineage going back yes. to those times with the Turks. That shows how close the relationship was. Yeah, yes, even our some of our uh, political leaders nowadays have uh, Turkish blood in them. Mm. So we were very close, you know. So if we were that close, it is not impossible that, you know, it wasn't just a social uh, uh, relationships. It could have been the relationship, could have been military as well. Mm. I mean, in that sense, it goes uh, across all levels of the demographic, not just military, economy, cultural, uh, warfare, yes. religion, poetry. Yep. All yep. of this can be traced back either to the Turks, to the Arabs, uh, even to some extent to the ancient uh, Hindu uh, cultures. Mm. There is basically yes. a melting pot of all these ideas and knowledge that is simmering here in the, the, the world that we call the Malay world, which creates a yes. unique identity, which is the Malay identity covering across many nations, many seas, in fact, with our own unique script. It's very hard yeah. to, to define another culture that adopts a different script writing with a different language entirely, synergizing it to what we know now as the Malay world. In your personal True. opinion, if the Malay worlds were to unite as a single nation, what do you think the strength of the Malay world would be? Oh. <laughs> uh, if the entire Malay world, as we know it, were to unite, we would have an empire extending from Africa to Japan, which is practically half of the, uh, or maybe even more than half of the world's population. Mm. So it would, it would be a very powerful entity. Mm. You know, if the entire Malay world would unite and uh, come together under one ruler. And to put that into a into a more specific perspective, when we talk about 
the strength of an empire. Most people will talk about land mass. But here, mm-hmm. I think the distinction with the Malay world, our jajahan or our jurisdiction are the seas. Yep. So that will exemplify if other cultures are basically the lords of the land or perhaps uh, like the Mongolian uh, Khanid were the, the conquerors of the land mass. The Malay race or the Malay world, we are the lords of the sea and water. What do you yes. think about that statement? I totally agree with that because if you look at the ancient Malay kingdoms, they were mainly uh, maritime. Okay? And uh, I would like to quote an instance uh, from one of the uh, uh, one of the documents found uh, during the Chola uh, raid. Uh, that would okay. be Chola. Chola is the Danur Veda document? Um, it was actually a bunch of receipts. Oh, okay. <laughs> written, All right. Written on on, uh, on pieces of copper. Ah, trade receipts. Yeah, trade receipts. Okay. Okay, and in, in one of these receipts, um, uh, there was a salutation to the king of Chola. Ah, okay. So, uh, uh, for example, this is uh, His Majesty the King of Chola. Okay. And then there was another salutation to the ruler of the Sri Vijaya Empire. Mm. As we know, Sri Vijaya is a Malay Empire. Mm. So the salutation to the Sri Vijaya king or, or ruler was uh, His Majesty the King, uh, the Great Lord of the Sea, the Master of the Makara, so and so, this and that, King of Sri Vijaya. Mm, this is a uh, Pati Gajah Mada story, wasn't it? If I'm not mistaken. It was before that. Was oh, before, before that. that. Okay, all right. Mm-hmm. I see. So, if you look at, if you look at this, this, the, this the, the receipt came from Chola. Mm. So, they addressed their own king as His Majesty the King of Chola. But they addressed the King of Sri Vijaya as His Majesty the Lord of the Sea, blah, 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 owner of the Bakara, this and that, mm. King of Sri Vijaya. It shows that Sri Vijaya was a more powerful empire at the time. Mm. So uh, that shows the dominance of the Malay uh, people on sea. Mm. I mean, that's a very clear, uh, I would say, historical account based on a trade receipt. I couldn't imagine yes. like a thousand years from now if someone found my Shopee receipt and they would be thinking, what is going on to this guy? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so be careful where you keep your receipts or if you have any shameful purchases don't leave it around destroy it immediately <laughs> because maybe a, two, a, two, a thousand years later when there's archaeologists digging up and they'll be wondering why did you buy this item the baju wafa so <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, uh, I will just finish up on the questionings on this and the comments from uh, Shad Lishan no wonder la Ustaz teach us to read Al-Kafi and Zikir to protect ourselves. Yes, definitely. Yes, yes. You don't even have to buy the Baju Wafak from Shopee. As long as you memorize this uh, doa and this ayat, you should be fine. Uh, have faith in, in God, the one God. If, if you are a Muslim, have faith in that. Uh, next would be uh, Hazwan Zulkifli. Even now in modern warfare, supernatural is still used as example of Lahat Datu attack by the, the same Sulu army under Jamalul Kiram. So this is a more recent instance where uh, spiritual or supernatural tactics were used to take an advantage in a battlefield. Perhaps you can give some input on this one in modern context. Yes, uh, as I've said before, uh, the spiritual element has been used in warfare since time immemorial. So, even in modern times, uh, some uh, armies or some uh, forces still use them. But to me, uh, on, a, on, a, on a practical uh, point of view, nowadays it would be more for uh, morale, more for uh, you know, to 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 for the spirit of the soldier himself you know, to to get 
to give him confidence, to give him uh, uh, the will to fight. It's not so much of uh, protection because, uh, as we know, many of these uh, warriors who were killed by our military were found to have all sorts of tel- talismans and amulets and whatever, whatnot on them. So clearly, they die anyway. it didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> but they were, they were so confident of it that they attempted to invade a sovereign country. Mm. Just a few of them against a fully mechanized army. Mm. So you see, you see the, the, the psychological effect that it has It's a morale uh, booster. Yep. So it's a morale, morale booster. booster. Okay, all right. Yep, yep. It could have worked uh, the same way uh, back then. You know, it, there's also a morale booster. So I have this uh, thing with me. So I I can fight a uh, hundred men. It, it's kind of a psychological thing. Uh, could it be uh, another reason for this in, in the mess of the battlefield? For example, I'm taking the Turkish talismanic shirt. Let's say they were mm-hmm. um in, in a battle with the by uh with the uh I would say uh let's say the Hungarians or any of their uh non uh basically against their combatants could it be that the baju mm-hmm. or the talismanic shirt was used to identify those who has fallen? Yes, in a way, that could have been uh an and the function of the shirt as well because uh, you know your enemies will not be wearing that and uh, in a time of uh, back then uh, their armors did not differ much and they might even be using enemy armor that they captured so uh, it is yes it is possible that it is a form of identification for the Turkish soldiers so when, when you uh uh, when you arrange for the corpse to be uh, buried, maybe when they, they took off his clothes or something, they see, okay, this is ours. So they will uh, bury the, the, the dead in uh, the appropriate manner. Mm, because from what I understand, for example, uh, in, in, in the Islamic faith, if you, were, you died in the battlefield, you were to be basically buried alongside with all these uh, wounds and your clothing and your blood, that, that which symbolizes you as someone who died in the way of God. So in this sense, it could be one of the ways to identify because if you look now, even nowadays, again, uh, one, one Turkish person and one against a Greek person, they almost look the same. Yes, they have yes. a very similar feature. Yeah, they have similar features. So uh, it would have been... Uh... It would have been one of the ways to identify who is who. I mean, and another way they can do it is a little bit, bit more uh, intrusive, which they can see who's circumcised or not. But I don't think we want to. <laughs> I don't think we want to go that direction. <laughs> <laughs> that would be called desecration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, right now we have um a few more statements that we should close it uh by twelve o five. We have gone one hour extra. It's been a very interesting discussion here with Pak Kunara. And here we have um, uh, artists is just expressing their creativity, creativity than fact. Yes, we agree with that statement because sometimes artists will use based on memory and whatever they can perceive and understand based on their own cultures. Uh, and artists didn't go to war. Yeah, yes, probably they would be staring from far away. They can hardly see anything. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Been, uh, drawing based on uh, on the accounts of the soldiers, mm. they didn't really see what happened themselves unless they were there. Right. Uh, in in regards to this, there were some uh, speculations. I won't mention the literature or the author. There was a certain book that depicts uh, the Malay kingdoms in a certain way. However, upon investigating the literature, the author was not actually present in the region. He was actually. Uh, uh, basically documenting Goa. So maybe oh. you, you have some ideas on these kinds of interpretations of false information? Yeah, well, uh, this uh, 
this was quite common actually, especially during the 19th, uh, 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. Uh, especially uh, in, in regards of uh, Malaysia, when the uh, during the times of say the British uh, studying about say Malay weaponry, some of them did not even step foot on Malaysian soil or Malayan soil at the time. Mm. They were in England and the, the weapons were brought to them and described to them and they maybe they had some notes there. So, okay, they were they based on the, the, the example and whatever notes that they have, okay, they, they, they come up with a, their own interpretation of the weapon. And uh, looking at uh, the weapon out of context, it could have been anything. I mean, if you like I've uh, described earlier about Chris, there are hundreds of uh, variants of Chris. So you would not know this unless you are over here looking at the people wearing them, how they were used, how they were treated. But mm. uh, on the other hand, you are all the way there, halfway around the world, uh, sitting in your office with a Chris on your table, which could have been one of the best examples that we have which did not exemplify the typical Chris. Mm. Mm. So that's where the, the, the uh, misinformation came from. Mm. You see, it's, not, uh, it's not impossible. It's nothing new, actually. Mm, 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 so uh, what we do, what we are doing now is that we are trying to rectify most of these uh, misinformation and uh, we're trying to, to reveal or trying to tell the world uh, what we know of our own culture. Mm. I think that's a very fair proposition, especially considering now we intended to do this session for one and a half hours, end up being three hours. And uh, <laughs> we thank all of the people watching now. Uh, till this time, you guys are great. You've been sitting here for three hours with myself and Pak Kunara and listening to us rambling about what we have passion about, which is the tactics, the weaponry of the Malay world. So I think for uh, with that, uh, I would like to end the Q&A because if we continue this and we keep chatting, because I'm still getting messages here, uh, I, I think at this moment it's 12 o'clock, I will close the, the, question, the question and answer. At this point in time, uh, before we end this, I would like uh, for you, Pak Kunara, to give uh, some feedbacks and perhaps to quickly summarize your opinions on this matter. Okay, um, how to summarize all this? All right, uh, basically, uh, when we talk about arms, armor, and artillery, uh, fighting styles, equipment, uh, there are two things that we need to know. First thing is what we already know, and the second thing is that things that are being discovered or that things that are being revealed to us. Okay, so um, as in, I would not say I'm a hardcore academic, but um, uh, as, as a researcher, so to say, when I receive new information, I would evaluate and then if uh, the information seems to be uh, legit, I would discard the old one in favor of the newer one. So this is the attitude that we need to have, this, uh, this scientific mind, so to say. Uh, because this is how we uh, advance, this is how we, we go further, you know. Because if we keep holding on to whatever beliefs that we have before, and we do not want to accept new discoveries, then we, we're nowhere, we're just, we're just still there. Mm. You know? And we may even regress in that sense. Yes, we may even regress. So, uh, looking at uh, the disco new discoveries and looking at the new um, uh, information that we have about the Malay world, I think uh, it is a good thing that you know we should have a more open-minded approach to it. Um, and uh, for me specifically on gay swordsmanship, because previously. I don't think anybody has ever come up with a you know, full-scale uh, description of Malay swords and swordsmanship in uh, particular. There might have been uh, you know, 
fragments here and there, but not as in Seni Sumagajana, which is totally focused on the sword. So uh, my uh, my suggestion would be have an open mind, okay? study. And uh, most importantly, do not uh, talk behind people's backs. So if you have some wish to know, go ahead and ask person. Do not be afraid. Okay, you ask if you ask properly, if you ask uh, uh, sincerely. I'm sure anybody would, you know, would, would uh, answer you in a proper manner. But if you go and and uh, insult him, uh, I don't think you get whatever you answer that you are looking for. Mm. So this to adapt, adapt or um, adapt, adapt. What is adapt? Adapt is a what do you call it? How do you translate that? Etiquette? Adapt will be etiquette. Yeah, etiquette is a very important part of the Malay culture. So when we talk about Malay culture, adapt or etiquette is the first thing that we should address. And uh, by looking at this, we see how the Malays of old were very um, highly civilized, actually, in our own standards. So that's the other thing. We should look at our own standards instead of comparing our standards to Western standards, for example. Of course, uh, it's going to be comparing the cat to the fish again. So, mm. yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I, I guess in in, uh, in my in my in my understanding, based on your interpretation of the summary of the tonight's discussion, is to basically apply the scientific process in identifying the jati diri or the Malay identity, irregardless whether it is weapons, uh, language, or anything. But the main thing would be the adapt and the integrity of the Malay culture and world itself. Yes. Mm-mm-mm. Okay, I'll just finish it up to the, uh, right now with just three more comments here. It's not a question, by the way. It's just comments. Um, uh, yes, Malay is Lord of Sea by Shad Lishan. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Su Wen Yuan. Wow, regarding the Malay world united as one country, I think this will involve various ethnical issues. However, there this is a great issue worthwhile acquires profound discussion. You are exactly right. What do you think, uh, Pak Kunara? Yes. Um, when we talk about the entire Malay world, it will involve many, many ethnic groups. Uh, but like we said earlier, we have a common uniting factor. So, um, if the entire thing were to come together, uh, it will be, um, I would say it will become a harmonious mix. It would not be a chaotic one, it would be a harmonious one because we are all one. You know, we are essentially uh, from, from one source. And uh, incidentally, uh, Emily is, uh, is a research assistant in uh, the Museum of uh, Taiwan. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you Emily for watching uh, all the way from Taiwan eh? so uh, yeah basically it's a it's a big melting pot you know so uh, we will have issues here and there but uh, since we are one we will find ways to, to deal with it Mm-mm-mm. All right, and to to echo that, uh, uh, Su Su Wen Yuan uh, added, yes, agree with Malay is Lord of Sea. <laughs> uh, I I would be very careful with the term Malay is Lord of Sea. I would say the Malay world is the sea. Uh, because I I want I don't I want to be politically correct here. So let's try to not spe- uh, pin a specific ethnic, but I would just say the Malay world we control the sea in general, in that sense. Uh, from from Tekka Shoemaker, or Shoemaker, jarang-jarang orang nak bercerita tentang sejarah Melayu ini. Terima kasih atas ilmu dan cerita yang telah disampaikan. Okay, terima kasih. Uh, thank you so much, Tuan Nara and Tuan Anwar. Sangat best this topic. Thank you very much. That was the last message of the evening before all the comments has been uh, ended. 
So thank you very much, Pak Kunara. That time now is already 12.10. It's already Saturday. We started on Friday. And I hope if uh, any of you would like to have uh, more sessions on this, I have a few ideas that maybe we can uh, see you if you are into it. The first one would be the, the Malay language across the world. For example, the, our words is similar to certain words used by the Samoans, by the Hungarians, even as far as Cape Town, Africa. There are traces of the Malay language. That's one topic. Second topic would be the influence of the ancient Hindu kingdoms in early Malay civilizations and war tactics. And for this one, I also have another expert from India who studies the Danur Veda, who can come in and share these things with us. And finally, the third one would be all the links and discussions we had today, such as naval warfare, war formations, guns, cannons, and all as such, which was discussed today. So all this discussion today will be live on the YouTube channel where I will include subtitles for those of you who may not understand Amalai. Bagi mereka yang uh, kurang memahami bahasa Inggeris, kita akan letakkan sari kata di bawah yang mana ia akan ditranslatekan oleh Google secara otomatik. InsyaAllah kita akan buat lebih seperti ini lagi. Uh, jadi Pak Kunarah, kata-kata terakhir untuk penonton-penonton dari Malaysia. Okey, uh, saya ucapkan terima kasih kerana sudi uh, bersama kami malam ni dengar kami berjeloteh tapi uh, apa yang penting di sini ialah uh, kita seharusnya kita bersatu okay. dan uh, sebagai bangsa Melayu uh, jangan jangan kita berpecah disebabkan isu-isu yang kecil okay. apa yang tak puas hati ni tu Uh, cakap terus bagi tahu dekat orang tu sendiri jangan cakap belakang dia ya, jadi itu bukan bukan budaya kita tu mengata belakang tu bukan budaya kita tu bukan budaya Melayu jadi be a Malay jadilah orang Melayu mm-hmm. gentleman tanya depan-depan mm-hmm. ya, ni macam mana ni macam mana lepas tu kalau setuju setuju kalau tak setuju ok biar tak payah nak cari gaduh mm-hmm. itu pendapat dia pendapat dia pendapat dia pendapat kita pendapat kita Mm, mm, mm. Kan? Kalau kita boleh setuju dengan dia Kita setuju Kalau kita tak setuju Okay that's it mm, Itu mm. pendapat dia Janganlah kita nak paksa pula Kita punya otak Ini macam ni macam ni Itu bukan cara Melayu Cara Melayu dia halus mm. Dan kalau kita tengok mm. macam Kalau macam cerita Piramli kan Yang mana walaupun mm. dia bergaduh Dia masih bersajak ha. Ha. Dia tunjukkan adabnya begitu tinggi Dia letak kat situ Walaupun dia marah betul ni Tapi tetap berlapik mm. Dan tapi lapikannya bila difaham maknanya Tajam lagi tajam daripada pedang wow. <laughs> Baik terima kasih banyak-banyak Thank you everyone from our viewers uh, From all over the world And especially from our Malaysian viewers Thank you very much for joining us Thank you very much Pak Kunara For spending three hours on this online channel Chatting and chatting and chatting <laughs> All right. Uh, in that sense, I would like to end the evening today with Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and salam hormat.